Il est 11 heures. Bonjour, mesdames, messieurs. Esther Bégin qui vous souhaite la bienvenue. It's 11 a.m. Good morning. This is Esther Bégin welcoming you to our special coverage on CPAC for the throne speech, which is going to be read by the Governor General in two hours. We have just seen Mary Simon. She is the first Indigenous Governor General who will be reading the speech, setting forth the government's priorities and officially starting the 24th 44th rather parliament. So what are we to expect over the next few hours? With me is my colleague Martin Stringer in the lobby of the House of Commons. What is uh, going to be the issue you're most uh, looking for? One thing that's drawn a lot of attention is the person who's going to be making the speech. This is a baptism of fire for our new Governor General. Mary Simon. She is the first Indigenous Governor General. The throne speech is to last approximately 20 minutes. It's relatively short. It has uh, also, we've also heard that she will be saying a few words in Inuktitut and uh, in French, a language that she confesses she doesn't speak very well, but she's made a commitment to improve it. So a uh, speech lasting 20 minutes or so, saying out the broad lines of the government's priority. It is a significant exercise, and it's kicking off this new parliament. So how important is the speech? The speech is crucial because basically the speech from the throne is a confidence vote. It is voted on, and the parties will have to essentially state their position. That is a confidence vote. If a minority government doesn't receive the support of at least one of her con of one other party, it could in fact fall on the vote to the, the vote on the speech for the throne. It is a speech that sets out the government's broad legislative priorities. There won't be any huge surprises because we have just been through an election campaign during which the government talked about its priorities, economic renewal, climate change, reconciliation with indigenous people, investment in health, and affordable housing. So we know what their main priorities are. Now, how quickly is the government going to be able to get its program through? Because it is a minority government. What obstacles might stand in the Liberals' way? The greatest challenge is that uh, during the election campaign, and uh, as we heard from the government house leader as well, during the campaign, the prime minister had set out priorities, and the government house leaders set out four that they'd like to get through before Christmas, four bills on 10 days paid sick leave for federally regulated employees. That is an election promise. Furthermore, legislation banning protests in areas where healthcare workers are working, so that's to protect them from harassment by protesters. legislation to underpin economic renewal and uh, something to replace emergency benefits. That is a crucial legislative uh, piece as well. And there's a fourth item, a fourth priority. They will bring back legislation to ban conversion therapy. The so-called therapy that is supposed to change people's sexual orientation. So we will be seeing some rather controversial bills coming back. What uh, chances do the Liberals have of getting that legislation through before Christmas, since this will not be a long session? It'll be quite short. It'll be cut off by, by the holiday period. So what are the chances, really, that they can get all that through? Well, that is the question. There will only be 20 sitting days before the Christmas holidays. The House won't be back until uh, late January. So just introducing the bills in the House of Commons will take time in getting them through that process. Then they would have to go through through the Senate. We know that uh, there will be support from the opposition for the anti-harassment legislation and for 
any um, paid sick leave provided, but it'll be difficult to imagine how that can get through before Christmas. Thank you, Marta. So we will leave you until the throne speech. So to talk a bit more about it with me are Joël Denis Bellavance, journalist with La Presse, and uh, Daniel Bellon, political scientist at McGill. Well, this is uh, Mary Simon, the new Governor General's baptism of fire. We know that she had committed to learning French. Danielle, what are you expecting from this throne speech? It is indeed her baptism of fire. First uh, throne speech. We'll be hearing uh, Inuktitut as well as uh, English and French. So people are certainly going to be interested in in her French to see whether it's improved. With regard to content, she will be reading a speech prepared by the Prime Minister and his team, but she will no doubt add a personal touch as an introduction before reading the actual speech. So I'm curious to see what she has decided to say, how she's going to introduce herself. So this will be a short speech, under 20 minutes, with some French and some Inuktitut. What will you be looking for? Joël Denis, the government's ambitions, uh, Martin summarized it very well. There will be some detailed, well, there are certainly priorities on which we've already heard details, but will there be any surprises? Because certainly some bills will have to be kicked off quickly if they want to get anything through before Christmas. You said this would be Mary Simon's baptism of fire, but uh, I have knowledge that some people are looking at the clock to see how quickly she will be able to read through the French parts. There are very significant passages in French regarding the government's priorities, we know what they are, the, what they are. so there will be a lot of uh, repetition, but of course it's going to be couched in uh, throne speech language. Yes, yeah, so it's interesting to see how much space uh, French will take up or how much, what kind of a place French will have. What about uh, Aaron O'Toole? Danielle, Mr. O'Toole has to deal with uh, the issue of vaccination, the vaccination issue for his members. This caught up with him yesterday yet again. Is he going to be able to get away from this? It's a difficult issue, not just for him, but also for the party. We s can see that uh, they're going down in the polls and the this whole vaccination issue is really damaging the Conservatives. Aaron O'Toole's leadership is uh, under attack as well. He is walking a tight rope. That's at least one way of putting it. His caucus is divided. It's divided and uh, a lot of the discussion is going on behind closed doors. That's always a difficult thing for a leader to navigate. Joël Denis, we're expecting uh, Aaron O'Toole to put a question of privilege in the House today on the validity of uh, exemptions, vaccine exemptions. Canadians, the vast majority of Canadians are for vaccination. We've seen Mr. O'Toole jogging uh, to show that he was ready to get stuck into the new parliamentary session. But uh, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who gave him advice recently, asked him to invite uh, all members of his caucus who don't want to be vaccinated uh, or show resistance to be excluded from caucus. And I think that's good advice because that would put an end uh, uh, to the fact that uh, 
this is going to be and stay an ongoing issue. People who are being vaccinated, and that is the vast majority, are wondering where the Conservatives are at. Quebec uh, Conservative members uh, have been vaccinated, but for the rest, we just don't know. Joël Denis, yesterday, Gérald Deltel was saying that he'd submitted and the medical exemptions of conservative MPs to have them checked by experts at the House of Commons. How is that different from what the Liberals are asking for? The Liberals want that verification to be carried out by an independent expert, and they want the exemption criteria to be one of the six that the um, Chief Medical Officer of Ontario has set out because those are very specific medical criteria, medical grounds, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, they are established by the Chief Public Health Officer of Ontario. So this seems fairly straightforward. The opposition House leader in the House of Commons, Gérald Deltel, needs to carry the bad news uh, to the sergeant at arms because basically he is going to have uh, to be the person who stops uh, people coming in. Yeah, this is really going to be a thorn in the side of the Conservative Party. Let's come back to this uh, minority government's agenda. We'll have a better idea in two years of what's in the speech. But we have heard that the Liberals would like to pass four bills before Christmas, and that's only in four weeks. Will the new government be able to push its agenda through so quickly? In some areas, I think so, areas in which the NDP is ready to cooperate, like uh, paid sick leave for federally regulated employees. It'll be rockier on other issues. Liberals have failed to get a majority government. That's what they've gone to the polls for, and it's going to hurt them on some issues. They'll really have to negotiate uh, things on a case-by-case -case basis with the opposition. Some things will be able to go through quickly, but uh, other bills might take more time. We'll have to be patient and see what happens in the lobbies as part of negotiations between the Liberals and the NDP, for example. Yes, we have heard rumors of a potential deal between the NDP and the Liberals. Joël Denis, what are you expecting to see before Christmas? Well, the timetable of getting four bills through doesn't seem realistic in only four weeks. So unless they use time allocation liberally, as it were, uh, I don't know how they could do that. I have also heard that the Minister of Finance should be tabling an economic update around February. That is a huge piece as well, and that is going to take up a few days of the session. So it doesn't seem that realistic unless they really uh, make use of time allocation. As you said, it's an ambitious agenda. A liberals, uh, the Liberal government has also managed to sign daycare deals with uh, nine provinces and territories, including Alberta. Danielle, will Justin Trudeau be moving ahead, do you think? Yes, and uh, the, the daycare agreements are very good. He'll be talking about the environment, about reconciliation. And uh, with Mary Simon reading the speech, I'm sure we'll be hearing broad themes uh, in that speech, the broad themes that uh, were set out in their campaign agenda, their campaign platform. It's a throne speech. It's not going to be too detailed. That's how throne speeches are. But I think that the broad priorities of Justin Trudeau and his Liberal Party will be very clear. It's an important throne speech because it's it may be a legacy speech, and he will probably want to show he can achieve things, and he's not a lame duck. Joël Denis, 
Do you think that today Justin Trudeau is uh, beginning on his last term? I think so, yes. That's what liberals heard when they were knocking on doors. He was no longer the much-loved uh, leader of 2015. That's what they heard when they were knocking on doors. So it's time, really, for him to build a legacy, the legacy that uh, people will remember him by. For example, uh, uh, something like 10 days of paid sick leave will be a very significant economic and social policy. The carbon tax will be a benchmark not only in Canada but in many European countries. So a legacy that he's built. I don't think that Mr. Trudeau will try for a fourth term. So potentially his last term begins today. Daniel Joel Denis, thank you. Always very interesting to talk to you. Bye bye, thank you. Thank you, Esther. I'll uh, carry on the discussion with Stephanie Chouinard, uh, with uh, Frederic Boilly and uh, Stephanie Chouinard. Welcome, both of you. First of all, I'll put a general question. What will you be watching for in the throne speech? Stephanie, we're expecting that the throne speech will be, well, it'll be the first one read by Mayor, Governor Mary Simon. So it'll be interesting to see how much French there is in it. It'll also be interesting to see how the government plans to uh, exit the pandemic. They've been mired in the pandemic for close to two years, and they're very interested in moving on. So what is post-COVID going to look like? A reset, yes, that'll be interesting. Frédéric, what will you be looking for? We can hear you now. Please, please go ahead. We can hear you. So, yes. Is the government going to be ambitious or not? The election was called because the government wanted a clear mandate. So it could engage in its post-COVID program. So is the throne speech going to set out the broad lines of its program? They're going to present, we hope, ambitious goals in a number of areas. Alberta, for example, the environment, natural resources, we saw that with uh, the new cabinet. We know that this is going to be a goal. It's clear. So it will be interesting to see what the government plans to do with the environment and natural resources and whether they will actually give a clear indication of it in the throne speech. Yes, which is now barely two hours away. Between now and Christmas, the Liberals would like to modernize the Official Languages Act. Get that through. Stephanie, what are we to think? Well, it's depressing that it hasn't been done yet because we've been talking about the Official Languages Act for years. But let's face it, are we really surprised? This is not the first time we've had promises that uh, are not kept. During the last election, the government was going on about how that act was going to be modernized within the first 100 days of the 2019 term. But it's uh, becoming harder and harder to imagine how that might be. It's certainly not a priority for this government. The new Minister of Official Languages, Jeanette Petitpa Taylor, is in a difficult position. It was clear that she would have to fill Melanie's shoes, and Melanie Jolie had the Prime Minister's ear. This is a secondary issue for Mr. Trudeau's government, official languages. That's clear. Frédéric, do you expect anything about official languages in today's speech? 
Well, there should be something in it. There was something about official languages in the previous speech, which was uh, read barely a year ago, a little over a year ago, I should say. But as Stephanie has just explained, it may take longer than the first 100 days before there can be some agreement. The opposition, be it the bloc, the conservatives, also have specific demands. And there are also demands coming from civil society, which might end up being tacked on to the new bill. So we'll see. What about affordable daycare? I was talking about that issue with Joel Denis and uh, Danielle. Mr. Trudeau has concluded uh, child and daycare agreements with nine provinces and territories, but not Ontario. Why isn't it working with Ontario, do you think, Stephanie? Well, Mr. Ford's uh, reasoning is that Ontario would not get its fair share in the way the financial daycare pie is being distributed. But eight of ten provinces have signed, one of the three territories have signed, so Mr. Ford is uh, a bit, well, it's a bit late in the day for Mr. Ford to be making that argument. It's uh, one thing for him to try and put pressure on the federal government, but Mr. Trudeau's government knows full well that it's Mr. Ford who's going to stand for election in June 2022, and that daycare, affordable daycare is extremely popular. It is something that Ontarians really want to see. So Mr. Ford is trying to get a few extra million during the last straight, but it's going to be very surprising. If it, it'll be very surprising if he doesn't give way before the next, uh, before he has to go to the polls. Joel Denis and Daniel uh, were talking about that. Do you think Mr. Trudeau is going to try to build legacy programs at this point? Yes, I do. I don't think he's going to come back and stand for a fourth term. So I think he is now building his legacy, as uh, Joël Denis was saying. So the National Daycare Program is very important in that legacy. And Doug Ford really isn't going to have much choice, especially since Jason Kenney has just uh, managed to reach an agreement. Albertan conservatives can also can use that to show that even conservatives can come up with a program that is socially progressive and popular. That means it's very likely that Doug Ford will also end up signing on. And that is a very important legacy piece for Mr. Trudeau. We're running out of time. What about the dynamics in the House of Commons? Today's uh, government is almost a cut-and-paste version of uh, the last one, but the dynamics could be different. Is it possible, or do you think, that there'll be a deal between the Liberals and the NDP? What are you expecting? Well, the dynamics will change in that uh, there seemed to be a very clear message from Canadians to the House, and that message was, please try to agree, at least for a while. So the kind of toxic partisanship we were seeing at the end of the last uh, parliament, there should be less of. And we do have the impression that the cooperation between the Liberals and the NDP is going to continue. Basically, the NDP is going to support the minority Liberal government because there are a f quite a number of projects that uh, suit them, paid sick leave, $10 a day daycare, and so on. But uh, there's also the fact that the NDP is now out of money. The NDP spent a lot of money in this campaign, more than in any other campaign, and they have to refill their coffers. So you're saying this minority government could last, what, 18 months, two months, two years, three? 
I, I think they could well last three years. Because, as Stephanie just said, Canadians made it fairly clear that they want to see the parties working together, at least uh, at a basic level. The Conservatives are pretty partisan. We've seen that with the shadow cabinet. Pierre Poilievre is finance critic, and uh, he is uh, very good at escalating things rather than de-escalating uh, partisanship. But the Liberals are very likely to find support among the NDP and potentially from the bloc. And the Conservatives could well remain isolated on a number of issues. They're also good at infighting. So there could be a, a sort of a mini parliament within the Conservative Party ranks. Yes, we saw something of that last week. Stéphanie, Frédéric, thank you for being with us. We'll see you every Tuesday during the session. Thank you and enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Well, that's it for our discussion before the throne speech. Do stay with us. My colleague Peter Van Dusen will be with us in a moment to continue our special coverage on CPAC. I'll be back tonight with L'Essentiel, our usual program, at 8.30 p.m. tonight. So we are going to give you the opportunity to tell us what you think will be in the throne speech. I would really like to see genuine commitment to uh, the whole concept of building back better, and, and that includes social and climate justice. So that's what I would like to see. The current government addressed a lot of uh, Aboriginal uh, issues. Um, obviously, with all the um, uh, residential school scandals, uh, that's something that the government should tackle uh, head on. Uh, but uh, you're right, I, I think uh, um, creating more job, more well-paid job, uh, that should be something that the government is uh, prioritized. Well, definitely tackling inflation a little bit and uh, continuing with, like, it's nice to see the green initiatives coming out where they're giving subsidies for heat pumps and solar energy and stuff so that's that's nice and um, yeah, maybe f a little less focus on the pandemic and a little more focus on other things other areas of our, our health going in the right di direction on climate change and I'm not convinced that the carbon tax is the way to go um, better relations with our neighbors period being more forceful instead of wishy-washing on everything on everything Kind yeah, of. I think it took too long for the, the the vaccine cart, the national vaccine cart, to come into play. That could have been done a long time ago. But our prime minister wanted to have an election, it seemed like, and he <laughs> couldn't do it until after. Nothing. It's all going to be blah, blah, blah. Now, granted, I'm, I, I like Trudeau. I don't like the others. But it's all blah, blah, blah. Nothing is going to get done. What would you like to see included in the speech from the throne? That is a hard one. Well, I think just like overall the affordability crisis that we're all experiencing. Um, if you look at like the statistics that show you how much you need to make to live in the, the cities, that the big cities around here, it's just, it's astronomical. Like people can't afford anything anymore and we need to change that. I think we need a government that's gonna, you know, actually help the people. <laughs> um, I think we need to, mention uh, climate change and really stick with that. Um, it's great to have leaders go to COP26 or whatever it was called and, and say they're going to do this, but I think we need to see some things on the ground. Um, I think the Prime Minister needs to follow through on his commitments to the Indigenous communities and to um, really sort of seeing where the residential schools are at and how we can support the survivors that way. Um, I'd like to hear about the reconciliation. That's important for Canada, and um, that's about it, really. Really? Why does reconciliation is important for Canada? 
would you say that? Well, there's, there's a lot of strife in, in, the, in the history of Canada, and um, I think it has to be addressed. And I think the present government has gone in the right direction. And uh, once that's, that is addressed, then we can start the healing process and we can live together as a united country. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to see infrastructure spending. I, I think that uh, we're seeing a huge uh, infrastructure spend in the U.S. that's coming over the next decade, and I think Canada needs to keep up with that. I think interest rates are low right now, so it's the time to borrow and spend. Uh, and I think that just looking around the world, uh, you lose a competitive uh, uh, situation if you don't keep up with the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Europeans. So I, that that's the top of my thinking. And, and we've got uh, indigenous uh, reconciliation to uh, deal with. And I think we, I, whether that's truly a government thing or it's a people thing, I you know I, I kind of split on that. I think climate change has to be top of the agenda. That, as far as I'm concerned, that's that the the pandemic may be coming to an end, but but climate change is a huge threat for the next 20 years. Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and this is continuing special coverage on CPAC of the speech from the throne. Uh, we heard from uh, uh, the streets and Canadians and their expectations. The uh, speech will be delivered in about 90 minutes from now by Governor General Mary Simon in the Senate. It will be the new Governor General's first speech from the throne outlining the minority Liberal government's priorities and direction for the country. Coming up, I'll speak with Climate Change Minister Stephen Gilbo. That's going to be one of the themes of the speech. Canada's climate agenda will figure prominently, we expect today. I'll also be joined by our political commentators for their takes on what we should listen for and how opposition parties might respond and the road ahead. But first, CPAC's Martin Stringer is on Parliament Hill with more on how the day will unfold. Martin, uh, good to see you again. Let's start with the person delivering the speech from the throne and how this will be a historic day. Well, that's it, Peter. A lot of the attention of this speech to the throne will be the person delivering it, and that is Mary Simon, Canada's first uh, Indigenous uh, uh, Governor General. We have been told that the speech will be about 20 minutes long, and that is relatively short for speeches from the throne. We've also been told that Ms. Simon will be delivering some passages in, in Inuktitut, her native language. Uh, we've also been told that there will be some passages in French. Uh, Ms. Simon has admitted she doesn't speak a lot of French, but she has committed to improving uh, her her. her, her French, um, we know that it will contain the big themes that the government intends to have for this 44th Parliament, uh, including what was discussed abundantly during the election campaign, uh, and that would be the reconciliation with the Indigenous people, uh, climate change, affordability, in uh, especially affordable housing, uh, investments in health care. Uh, so those are some of the big themes that we're going to hear in the speech from the throne. And I'm hearing it will essentially repeat the election platform, Martin. No big surprises, no great detail, but what are some of the key areas of focus we will hear about in terms of the government's plan to move quickly on some key areas of legislation? Well, that's the thing, Peter. It's interesting because during the election campaign, uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, committed to uh, legislative action in several fields, and he promised it within the first 100 days of his government. Now, of course, the time is ticking down, and the uh, Parliament is only sitting until uh, the end of December, uh, so there's, very, there's only about 20 days of sittings left. The four big priorities that were identified by the Government House Leader, Mark Holland, yesterday uh, include, uh, first of all, the successor legislation for the economic measures. So these would be the successors to the CRB and the uh, rent subsidy for hard-hit uh, sectors that are still suffering from the pandemic, investments in healthcare, specifically also um He's going to propose uh, reintroducing that bill to ban conversion therapy. Uh, this will be the third attempt that the government will have to try and get it passed. Also, uh, the, the government is proposing and has promised during the election campaign 10 days of paid federal sick leave. Uh, so that's also one of the big promises. And legislation to protect health care workers. Uh, that was promised, and that's to protect them from, uh, from demonstrators. And we've seen anti-vaccine demonstrators harassing uh, health care workers across the country. Mm. Okay, and, and what should we expect uh, uh, to see in terms of reaction from the opposition parties? They're sort of already laying out the, uh, their sort of ground on what they want to see, what they expect, and how they might react. What should we watch for? 
Well, one of the questions to the opposition parties will be whether they're willing to fast track some of those key items of legislation. Uh, the NDP, for example, was asked about that, and uh, they have said that they have some problems with the successor to the CRB, the uh, Canada, uh, Canada uh, Emergency Benefits, uh, but they would be ready to uh, help the government quickly pass its legislation on, on federal health, uh, federal sick benefits, as well as that legislation to protect health care workers. Uh, for the Conservatives, they have big concerns about anything that they say would add to uh, this very, very considerable federal debt. So it'll be interesting to parse how they come out. Uh, and there are discussions ongoing, we know, with uh, the NDP in terms of uh, uh, supporting government legislation. So we'll have to see the tone uh, from all of the opposition parties. Right. Um, and of course, hanging all of, over all of this is the whole question of, of hybrid parliaments. And the government's going to be pushing this week on that, we expect. The question of vaccination is still there and exemptions for some Conservative MPs. Yeah. That hangs over uh, the sitting as Parliament gets underway as well. So lots to watch. Martin Stringer, thank you. You're welcome. Talk to you later. The speech from the throne will set out, as we've talked about, the government's broad action plan for the new Parliament. In a moment, I'll speak with the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, Stephen Gilbo, about the agenda for climate action. It will be a significant part of the speech from the throne, uh, we expect. But um, ahead of that, let's spend a few minutes looking at the long road to the 44th Parliament and what to watch for. The House of Commons has been quiet for the last five months. For the next four weeks, the Liberals are promising to make up for lost time, with a busy agenda pushed along at a frantic pace. The Prime Minister promised action on key initiatives within 100 days of the new mandate. So expect the speech from the throne to outline an accelerated timetable for tabling priority bills between now and early February. They return to Parliament uh, with a mandate to do big, ambitious, progressive things for Canadians, and I can't wait to get into it. Expect the Prime Minister and his government to ask for speedy approval from opposition parties to pass legislation to protect health care workers from intimidation and harassment from anti-vaxxers. And another bill to implement targeted ongoing pandemic emergency benefits. Expect a speech from the throne to restate the government's promise to quickly ban the practice of conversion therapy aimed at changing someone's sexual orientation or gender identity. And also a promise to move quickly on two other election commitments. Whether it's completing the uh, child care agreements with the provinces so that uh, $10 a day child care is a reality as soon as possible right across the country, which is both great for families but also great for the economy and the recovery. Uh, we're going to be moving forward on 10 days paid sick leave uh, for uh, federally regulated areas. Just last week, Trudeau signed a child care deal with the Alberta Premier, leaving only New Brunswick and Ontario as holdouts. They need to come to the table and they need to present us with a proper deal. I'm not going to get the, the short end of the stick on this. I have to represent the people of Ontario. The worst thing we could do, the worst, is sign a bad deal. Other government priorities include reintroducing legislation to reform the Broadcasting Act and regulate Internet giants, reforming the criminal justice system to address the disproportionately high incarceration levels of black and indigenous people, and legislation to safeguard Canada's critical infrastructure, and whether that will include banning Chinese vendor Huawei from any role in building next-generation mobile networks. Uh, good morning. The Conservatives are once again the official opposition. Aaron O'Toole will challenge the government over inflation, the pandemic response, and national unity. But O'Toole has his own unity issues to deal with in the Conservative Party over his leadership. Just last week, kicking Saskatchewan Senator Denise Batters out of caucus for launching a petition to subject O'Toole to a leadership review within six months. People that are now allowing the frustrations and their own personal agendas or, or, or issues on the pandemic to, to interfere with our progress are not part of the team. And so we're, we're, we're focused and that's why we made the decision last night. You don't want to make that decision but really she made it for herself. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has abandoned his position from the last minority parliament when he pledged to support the Liberals on every confidence vote to avoid a pandemic election. Singh says he's committed to making this parliament work, but wants to see a clear signal in the speech from the throne that the Prime Minister is truly committed to working with the opposition. We've withheld our votes in the past uh, and we're prepared to do that again. Uh, we want to help people and we want to see concrete steps that will help people. There's also disagreement over how the House should sit. Conservatives and the Bloc want full in-person sittings. The Liberals and New Democrats favour extending the in-person 
and virtual hybrid model. I'm still in the middle of this pandemic uh, where we don't know where this is going. It's important for us to continue these hybrid provisions. I don't want to be back in a situation in January or February where we're having to renegotiate how the House is operating. I am not in favour of a virtual Parliament. The Conservatives want to see a return of Parliament and its committees to normal. Mr Trudeau you did, used the virtual Parliament to hide the We Charity scandal, to hide sexual misconduct investigations, to hide contracts in the vaccine procurement in the COVID-19 crisis. We will not allow Mr. Trudeau to hide behind a lack of accountability in the House of Commons. Provincial premiers will also be watching to see how the government responds to their repeated demands for a massive influx of federal cash for health care and what conditions could be attached to that funding. Municipal leaders also have their demands. Billions more in funding from the federal government to offset losses in mass transit revenues during the pandemic, that's at the top of the list. And so is more money for housing and an expectation that all parties in the minority parliament will support that. You know, for the first time in my living memory, um, you know, housing was an issue of every major party in the first week of the election campaign. So I think that there's a lot of support across parliament, this minority parliament, to support housing uh, and uh, including homelessness. I think we will find um, a willing partner with the federal government. The Prime Minister had hoped by calling an election when he did, he would win a majority government and have a clear mandate to push through his priorities. Instead, he's facing another minority parliament. Expect a speech from the throne to preach cooperation in parliament while insisting the Liberals have a mandate to implement their agenda. Stephen Gilbo is Canada's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. He is with me now. Uh, Minister, good to see you again. Thanks for taking time to speak with me. Good morning. Look, uh, we've all seen what's happening in British Columbia. Do you make a straight line connection between the changing climate and the storms that have been ravaging BC? Well, it's actually, from a scientific perspective, very difficult to link a specific uh, extreme weather event with, with climate change. What we do know is because of climate change, because of a warming planet, we are seeing and we will continue to see more and more of these extreme weather events. And that's certainly been the case in, in Canada and, and around the world uh, over the last few years. So in terms of dealing with the reality, I, I, we know the government has a plan to, uh, to green the economy, to accelerate mm -hmm. climate change uh, action. Uh, so we know about those pledges, uh, but what more will the government be uh, proposing to deal with the issue of adaptation and to fund the kinds of infrastructure changes needed to deal with the climate events happening now? That's a very good point, Peter. And I think clearly for, uh, for a very long time, most Canadians thought that adapting to climate change is something that developing countries would have to do and small island states, but not really Canada. And, and, and clearly what we're seeing is that we need to adapt here as well, uh, for, certainly from an infrastructure perspective, um, uh, from a, an emergency preparedness per perspective, from a health perspective. And in fact, Environment and Climate Change Canada is working to develop the first uh, national adaptation strategy. Uh, we, we have started consultations with, with provinces, territories, uh, stakeholders, Indigenous leadership, and we will continue to do that so that we can we can have this, this national adaptation strategy up and running by roughly a year from now. Uh, successive governments have promised uh, emissions reductions targets that they've, they haven't been able to meet for the past 30 years. Y you say Canada is now on a path to achieve those more ambitious targets. What's changed? Well, the good news is that it's not the government that's saying that, but it's independent experts. A number of them have said when they've looked at our plan, when they've looked at the measures we proposed during the last election campaign, they said that Canada is on its way to meet to meet its target. What has changed is that, well, for, for a very long time, we kept having conversations and debate in Canada about targets and, you know, whose targets was bigger than whose. And, and, and never really about how do we get the job done, like, like actually putting in place measures, a price on pollution, record level investment in public transit, in electrification of transportation, in funding uh, active transportation infrastructure, uh, putting in place new regulations to reduce the, the amount of methane emission, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas, which Canada already has in place. So, and, and billions of dollars of investment in, in, in the green economy. 
and that's really what what's starting to to have an impact mm -hmm. in in climate change when you when you project where emissions were going all the way to 2030 we've already reduced those 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 emissions to 2030 by roughly about what half of Quebecers emit every year. Mm. So our plan is working, but I'm the first one to say we need to do more. And during the last election campaign, we we committed to do a number of, of, of more aggressive measures because that's what Canadians told us. Go we ahead. want you to do better on climate change and we want you to do it faster. And let's talk next steps. What are next steps in your government's plan? What are the first, you know, uh, move forward now, Parliament's back. Uh, the government now gets a chance to try and implement the agenda it campaigned on that it's put before Canadians. So uh, what are we going to see? first? What are the government's uh, next step plans to build back better and build back greener? Well, we will continue to deploy the, the tens of billions of dollars that, that, that have been announced and, and in some cases have already started being deployed. I was referring to transit, for example, 300 new transit projects under construction right now in Canada, a thousand more in, in the process of being of, of being approved. So Canadians are going to see if, from one side of the country to the other, a number of new transit projects. Um, we will be introducing new regulations early in 2022 um, that's called clean fuel standards. So basically, we will, we will force um, the, the companies that produce liquid, uh, liquid fuels mm -hmm. to, to, to make them cleaner and cleaner, either by investing in, in new technologies to, re to, to reduce the amount of pollution that, that they make or blending with, with, with biofuels or investing more in, le in electrification of transportation. So this is coming very early in, in, in 2022. Uh, we, uh, we will be starting in, in the very near future, a matter of weeks, consultation with provinces and territories and other stakeholders around the, the, the cap on oil and gas emissions that, that, that we promised during the last election campaign. We're the only large oil and gas producing nation in the world that has committed to, to doing that. Um, why why do that? Mm. Well, it's 25% of our pollution mm. in Canada, but, but, so but we need to, to, to do something about that. Let me ask you that. It, but isn't the real difference maker rolling back production, not capping emissions levels? Uh, doing that still encourages production. Well, not not, not necessarily. And, and, and I mean, what we have to what we have to think and, and remember is that what is the atmosphere seeing? And if the atmosphere is seeing less pollution, then we're achieving our goal, and 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 and, and of course we, we need to think we need to be thinking about production of, of fossil fuels, but we also need to be thinking about consumption. So the the demand side of things, which is why I've been talking about public transit, active transportation, electrification of our transportation system, and and the more we're successful in doing that, the more we'll reduce our dependency to, to fossil fuel in the other largest emitting sector in Canada, which is transportation. Both these sectors, energy production and transportation, account for roughly half of our pollution in Canada. So if we can tackle these two sectors, we can make a serious difference in Canada when it comes to when it comes to climate change pollution. Right. Do, do you still make the case, as the prime minister has done, uh, that fossil fuel projects are still needed in this country uh, to help fund climate action? Uh, is that what you believe? I think what, what the Prime Minister has said is that every sector of our economy will need to be part of that transformation. So there, there, there isn't a plan where you know, the government will, will work with certain sectors but, but abandon others in, 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 in this transformation. And, and interestingly enough, if you look at a number, I was talking about biofuels earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, second generation ethanol, for example, m making ethanol, which can be used in, in vehicles or other form of combustion from, uh, from, from waste in our garbage bags. Uh, there's a company in Edmonton doing that right now. And the skill sets that these people need are very similar to the skill sets that you would find in the oil and gas sector. So the, the, the plan is really to, to work with every sector of our economy, every region of, of Canada to, to ensure that we embrace this transformation that is starting to happen in, in Canada already and, and around the world. Uh, you, you've also called for the phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. The federal government uh, provided some $18 billion in subsidies and other financial supports for the fossil fuel industry last year. Earlier this month, your government announced it will cut the subsidies to companies operating and expanding outside the country by the end of next year. So What's your timetable for phasing out entirely those subsidies to fossil fuel industries, and what's the reason for phasing them out now? Well, a number of, of reasons. I mean, we can't hope to reduce pollution while at the same time 
give money to company to continue increasing their production of, of, of fossil fuel. That simply, that there's no way we can we, we can do that. Uh, G20 countries committed in 2009 to, to, to phasing out those fossil fuel subsidies by 2025. We've taken uh, we've taken the commitment in Canada to do it two two years earlier than our G20 partners, and we've already started reducing by more than three billion dollars a year over the last two years, these, these subsidies. So they are declining rapidly uh, in Canada while we're increasing even more rapidly our investment in, 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 in clean technologies and, and, and renewable energy uh, industry in Canada. So these things go hand in hand. As, as our investment decline in fossil fuel subsidies, we will, be a, we will be able to invest more and more in clean technologies in Canada. All right, let's finish on this. Uh, I understand you'll be traveling the country in the new year by train uh, to hear from Canadians uh, about how to carry out the climate agenda. What are you expecting to hear? Well, I mean, we, we just came out of an election where where people told us they wanted to do to do better and faster when it comes to climate change. We have a number of very specific measures that we want to hear Canadians on. I mean, we've, you and I have been talking about the, the cap on oil and gas emissions, uh, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. So there are a number of things on, on which we would be very interested to hear what Canadians have to say in terms of not, not so much to target, because I, I think there is broad agreement on, on, on targets, but how do we do it? All right. Uh, Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, Stephen Gilball. Always good to talk to you, Minister. Thanks for your time today. Thank you very much. All right. That conversation, as we expect, uh, you know, a, a, a mention uh, exactly how much we'll hear about climate change and the government's commitment to accelerated action. We will wait for the speech. Uh, we know they've, we've talked about the priorities they want to uh, push through before, uh, you know, in the next four weeks of the, of the sitting of the House. So, uh, but we will hear about climate change and the government's commitment to accelerated action on that. Now we've got uh, some little bit of background on how the climate change minister thinks that will proceed. The Conservative finance critic, Pierre Polyev, he was out ahead of the speech from the throne this morning on Parliament Hill saying Conservatives are focused on the need for measures to deal with spiking inflation. Here's part of what he had to say. It's time to put an end to the Liberal inflation tax. Inflation's at 4.7%, an 18-year high, two and a half times higher than wage growth, and two and a half times higher than the Bank of Canada's 2% target. What causes inflation? Well, it's the same thing every time. Too many dollars chasing too few goods. Trudeau's thrown out almost a half a trillion dollars into the economy competing for scarce goods and driving up the prices. Price of housing up one-third, which drives the wealth gap. It makes rich, rich mansion owners wealthier while preventing working-class renters from ever owning a home. Gas is up. 41%. Obviously, oil prices are determined internationally, but our weak dollar is the result of too much money printing, which means that our purchasing power of international commodities is weakened. The price of food is higher, as the government has layered on new taxes and red tape for our food-producing farmers. In other words, the cost of living is, uh, is driven by the cost of government. Who knew? When you spend more, it costs more. And when Trudeau sent out that half trillion dollars, it bid up the price of goods, making life more expensive for everyday Canadians. In today's speech from the throne, Liberals must end their inflation tax. Now there are a number of practical steps they can do to achieve that. Eliminate the $100 billion slush fund of additional spending that they have proposed. Put forward a plan to phase out the deficit. Stop paying people not to work and re-sign the Bank of Canada's mandate to keep inflation low and to stop printing money. In other words, make more, cost less, paychecks, not debt. All right, that was finance critic Pierre Polyev from the Conservatives. Uh, here's a shot of the Senate, uh, just a few blocks down the uh, road from uh, Parliament Hill. Uh, the temporary Senate location in a former train station in uh, the city of Ottawa, in the nation's capital, where in the next 40 minutes or so, uh, things will start to happen there. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister will arrive, certainly the Governor-General will arrive, 1 o'clock Eastern time, 
uh, the speech from the throne delivered in the Senate chamber in our continuing coverage. In just a moment, I'm uh, going to get to our party commentators. Just ahead of that, I want you to hear the government House Leader Mark Holland also talking to reporters this morning on this whole issue that hangs over the House about uh, hybrid sittings, and the government will be pushing for that uh, before the end of this week. Also, uh, the whole idea of uh, the vaccine mandate. Who's vaccinated? They all have to be vaccinated to work in the precinct on Parliament Hill. Some Conservatives apparently have exemptions, and the Liberals have raised concerns about uh, the validity of those exemptions and how to double-check them. Here's Mark Holland just a few moments ago. I just wanted to ask you about this uh, motion you put on the order paper. Uh, it seems like you're trying to get some real specificity around medical exemptions. Yeah, it's clear that um, before just asking for a medical exemption, uh, what we need to go is one step further to make it clear what constitutes a valid medical exemption. And it makes sense to, to take that from uh, the, the jurisdiction which we're in, which is uh, from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, so that will allow a doctor to attest uh, that the medical exemption that's been given actually is from the list of what uh, should be uh, given as a medical exemption. And when would the debate take place on the vote? And is that a regular vote? Uh, explain the process, please. Uh, with respect to the hybrid, uh, the hybrid no, motions? For the, the whole motion. The whole motion, the whole motion. yeah. I'm sorry, I, including the, medical, the hybrid, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, the, the, the debate will uh, start on Wednesday, um, so uh, which is tomorrow. Uh, and the vote will depend on how long that debate takes place. So there's going to be an opportunity for Parliament to debate that. Uh, so at this time, we don't know how long, when that vote will occur because it will depend on when the debate collapses. But obviously, you want this to happen soon because you want the hybrid to kick in soon, right? Uh, the, the current situation, in my view, is, is not tenable, that we need to move towards this hybrid model. We do need to do that expeditiously. I want all parties to be able to make their arguments and have an appropriate time to debate the matter. Uh, but I don't think that it is so complex that it needs uh, days and days of debate. So I'm hoping that we can uh, deal with this expeditiously. Why do you think, why do you think we need to go back to a hybrid model? Why does it not take right now? Well, I think there are, there are two things. Let's start from the fact that uh, members who are symptomatic, uh, who are diagnosed with uh, COVID, uh, suddenly would be in a position where they cannot participate in, uh, in, in the proceedings, which is a concern. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the, uh, I think it creates... Uh, pressure for members to show up, uh, even if they're feeling a little under the weather, to show up. Uh, and it's not a time. Like our hospitals are in a situation where they're full. We don't need additional sick people or, or risking others to, the, to illness. So if uh, folks are sick, they need to stay home and we need to encourage that. Moreover, I, we've dealt with this enough as a house. I don't want to waste more house time. We do not know where this pandemic is going. We are still in a global pandemic. I do not want to be relitigating this in February or in March. All right, parliamentarians still uh, trying to figure out the whole vaccination mandate policy and uh, trying to figure out uh, hybrid sittings. Joined now uh, for our coverage this morning by our panel of party commentators, Susan Smith is a Liberal commentator, Kate Harrison is a Conservative commentator, and Danielle Delzell is an NDP commentator. Welcome to you all. Great to see you all this morning. Susan, let's start right there. Here we are. A speech from the throne should be uh, tying up everybody's interest today, uh, but we're still talking about vaccinations and the mandate for the House of Commons, hybrid sittings. What's happening here? Yeah, that's a bit frustrating, and I, I hear the frustration in Mark Holland's voice. That should be a pretty simple thing for Parliament to resolve. I think, interestingly, most MPs would like to have a hybrid model. It allows them, it, it, as, as Mr. Holland pointed out, if they have the sniffles, to still show up and do their work. They just show up on camera. Uh, so that is, I'm not sure whether it's a good use of time from a debate perspective. Yes, it's absolutely enthralling that the House is coming back. The speech from the throne will be riveting everybody today. Uh, no <laughs> doubt the government will be laying out its priorities and with a goal of, of a path to see the, a stable minority parliament for the next two to three years. I expect that they have some issues. Uh, there'll be things that they've signaled they'll be focusing on for issues, you know, COVID support, mm -hmm. Uh, sick pay for workers, um, uh, ban on conversion therapy, and uh, protecting healthcare workers in their places of work in terms of you can't protest outside. They'll be focusing on that, but they'll also be signaling the agenda for the rest of the term, housing right. affordability, climate change, and other things. All right, Kate, let me, let me have you pick up on, on the vaccine issue. How, how have conservatives handled this? Uh, well, I think it's a good thing the House of Commons is back because it provides a little bit more focus uh, for caucus members and MPs to turn their attention to some of the big issues Canada is facing. I think the discussion and the debate around vaccines is 
an important one. Uh, it is not as important as the one as talking about inflation and housing and how we're going to support the economic recovery out of this pandemic. That being said, when we're talking about fundamentally changing uh, how the House of Commons operates, uh, when the government is sending signals that we are ending, heading towards the end of this pandemic by, for example, removing some of the pandemic support programs that were in place, I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask questions around why a hybrid parliament would continue to persist, even though the government is acknowledging uh, that the pandemic is ending in other ways. So uh, it is definitely a bubble issue, don't get me wrong. Uh, people at home uh, probably don't care how parliament sits as long as it functions and functions well. Uh, but when we are talking about that kind of a fundamental change, there should be the space to debate it. All right, Danielle, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a bit of a distraction and kind of... You know, regular Canadians, everyday people have to get their vaccination to go to work. Um, it should be a safe workplace, not only for parliamentarians, but for the workers who serve our country as well. Um, I, I think a, a hybrid model works. That's great. Let's get on with it. But this sort of embarrassing vaccination distraction for the Conservatives is not a great way to, to start off Parliament and uh, not appreciated by most Canadians, I, I'm sure. Okay, Susan, the, the, you know, speeches from the throne are meant to be broad treatments of a government vision and not so much about precise details, although uh, certainly ahead of the speech, we heard lots about, you know, the government's, in, the four bills the government wants to push through before Christmas. But what do you think the overarching message is the government wants to send with this speech? It's that this parliament can work and that you've elected a parliament that, that will work for Canadians and that they're tackling the big issues of the day. And whether it's climate change or housing affordability or mental health or reconciliation or, of course, the pandemic and, most importantly, getting the economy uh, getting going again, that's what this parliament is about. And so those are the signals that they will be uh, putting forth. I think they'll be putting the markers out down on the ground saying, we campaigned on a platform, you elected us on a platform. Yes, we will and have to work with the opposition to get this legislation through. And that's what Parliament can do and this will work. And that will be the, that will be what the government intends to signal to people. All right, Kate, what, what message do you think the government wants to convey with the speech from the throne? And, and is there a need to convey a sense of urgency given uh, Parliament hasn't sat for five months? Yeah, I think that there should be some specifics, frankly, uh, because it's been three months since the election was called, two full months since we had the result of the election, virtually no change in Parliament. Uh, and it just feels like we're in a real period of stagnation in terms of getting things moving. Um, you know, certainly there needs to be a discussion around what the government is doing uh, in British Columbia. It sounds like parties are working together to try and uh, get them the support and the resources they need. So there should be some specific specificity as opposed to just uh, big themes all the time. And the number one issue, of course, right now is inflation and the economy, cost of living. Um, those aren't issues that the Liberals do typically talk about. Uh, we might hear about other bigger issues like climate change and reconciliation. Those things are very important. Uh, but we are seeing a bit of a divergence in public opinion between uh, what issues they care about right now and even what they cared about uh, on voting day. So that needs to be acknowledged in this speech from the throne, uh, particularly the cost of living, housing, and where people are really feeling hit in the pocketbook right yeah, now. Yeah, it sounds like, uh, you, you know, we might hear the word uh, nimble in the next number of months here about how uh, governments, uh, federally, provincially, are going to have to be pivoting as uh, we get a sense of where we're moving out of the pandemic and what sort of priorities pop up because of that as, uh, you know, countries and provinces move ahead and so on. Uh, Danielle, what are your thoughts on... on what message the government hopes to send Canadians with this speech from the throne and what message you think they need to send? Well, I, I think they, they've been focusing on climate action, on, uh, you know, affordability. They, they want housing changes. Uh, but I, I think all of that are, are great words. And we've heard words from this government over and over again. But we have had a delay of a, you know, largely unnecessary election. Um, and people are, are kind of, they need action now. I'm in BC and, you know, climate change is not uh, a far off concept. Uh, the climate emergency is here and it's on our doorstep. So uh, what we've heard from Jagmeet Singh is uh, immediate, urgent action to make sure infrastructure is there. 
uh, so we can adapt and, and be safe through climate uh, change, as well as investment in housing, which is an urgent crisis. Uh, it is across the country, uh, spreading into smaller communities, and we need the essential workers that we've learned in these past two years we rely on so much to be able to afford to live here. And uh, so all of those pieces are important, uh, but mostly with reconciliation specifically, uh, it's time for action. Uh, we, we can't wait and just hear words, arguably just words without action with regard to reconciliation, anti-racism are more damaging um, you know, than if you wouldn't uh, profess to do anything at all. So we certainly need to get going, uh, to 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 get through what is we're in multiple crises and and uh, we need to get through them safely. Susan, the government house leader uh, has already said there are those four bills he wants passed by Christmas: measures to extend the pandemic supports, protections for frontline healthcare workers, uh, paid sick days for all federally regulated workers, and the ban on conversion therapy. Where will the minority government? Where will the Liberals find opposition support to make that happen? To fast track those bills? Sure. I think the COVID supports, uh, they'll find them everywhere but the Conservatives. If Pierre Polyev's sig signaling uh, from his news conference rant today is any indication, the tourism industry may be very unhappy with Mr. Polyev. Yeah, although, although the, uh, Jagmeet Singh saying, look, if you're, if you're rolling back some supports for, uh, for workers that were getting the CERB, uh, he's not going to support it. So uh, he may have, if he's not going to find support from Conservatives or New Democrats, uh, is it the bloc? Well, it, it, it could possibly be there, and that's the magic of a minority government, right? Sometimes the government puts something forward and it needs to be tinkered with before it gets passed, and that's the good, that's the good part of democracy. I do ultimately see that this one would be passed. On the health care worker ban, I think he'll, or health care worker protection, mm -hmm. uh, I hope the Conservatives show up for this one. In addition to everybody else, this shouldn't be complicated, though I do suspect they'll protect their base that wants to protest in front of abortion clinics. So I don't see conservative support there. 62 conservative members under Aaron O'Toole in the last parliament voted against the conversion therapy bill. So the liberals will find their support in other parts of the House. It'd be nice if Mr. O'Toole's caucus showed um, that they could come and be more progressive on itch issues such as this. I think that hurt him. But the, I think the liberals will find their support there. And the 10 days of sick pay, the, the, the uh, support, though not without a few uh, brickbats will come from the NDP for the Liberals. All right, Kate, what role should Conservatives be playing in this Parliament, uh, given the Liberals are saying Canadians gave them a mandate to pursue their agenda? Yeah, I think it's going to be important for the Conservatives to focus on economic matters, right? Um, if there's talk about changing pandemic support programs, are those changes going to be satisfactory enough to make sure that uh, you know, we're not disincentivizing work for some, um, but not supporting perhaps elements of the recovery or industries that still need further support. So uh, getting into the weeds on what some of that support programming looks like, yes, there still needs to be uh, a timeline applied, but uh, it is a bit, you know, the government's speaking out of both sides of their mouths when they're saying, you know, uh, we're looking to end these support programs, but the pandemic isn't so over that we don't feel we should have different rules in terms of a hybrid setting of parliament. So getting into kind of economic matters, I think, is going to be really important for the Conservatives and showing, frankly, that they are willing to, to work across the aisle. I mentioned the disaster in B.C. Uh, there were a number of Conservative uh, British Columbian MPs that met with uh, Emergency uh, Management Minister Bill Blair to talk about that. Uh, it would be great to see that be perhaps the opening salvo in question period when that resumes, uh, because there isn't a lot of opportunity to put politics aside, especially when we're talking about uh, situations like that. So Conservatives need to know when to pick their battles. Right. We'll get a question period on Wednesday. Uh, Danielle Jagmeet Singh says he won't back the Liberals on any bill that uh, touched on it, any bill that reduces pandemic supports, but he's on side on sick leave, um, which the NDP has been pushing for for years, the ban on conversion therapy as well, and the protections for health care workers. So uh, my question is, how does Jagmeet Singh walk that line between supporting the Liberals uh, at many different turns, but not appearing to be rubber stamping the Liberal agenda? Well, I think we 
we saw him do that in the last minority parliament quite effectively, uh, pretty consistently. Jimmy Singh and the NDP are are focusing their fight on delivering tangible services and improving what the Liberals put forward to deliver for people. So he has said they will cooperate to fast track legislation that they agree with, um, that they believe should have been enacted a long time ago, like paid sick leave that Jigmeet said he called for 22 times before the election, before the Liberals made it an election promise. So I think we'll see them doing that, using their opportunities to leverage their position in the minority parliament when they can. Um, and then standing up for um, improvements when they think that they're necessary. Uh, Susan, the Liberals will also be looking to conclude child care deals with New Brunswick and Ontario. That's a big ticket item for the Prime Minister. Uh, but Premiers are also clamoring for more health funding. So how quickly will the Prime Minister want to deal with those two issues? Uh, very quickly, I think, on, in terms of child care, uh, I think we all agree, everybody, all the parties agreed that child care is an economic policy as, it, as we deal with COVID recovery. Uh, you know, when you can get a deal with Jason Kenney, surely you can get a deal with Doug Ford, especially as he's going into the election. I suspect that one will come with Mr. Ford. He won't want to be the only holdout premier there. There are lots of families in Ontario that could benefit from, uh, first, of course, the 50% cut in child care fees and then a $10, $10 daycare down the road. Uh, in terms of health care, that is the, the never-ending ask from the provinces. It's, uh, I think it's as fundamental to Canadian uh, constitutionalism or, or Canadian premiers' meetings as anything else. Uh, our healthcare system is getting more and more expensive. It was taxed to the max to deal with, uh, stretched to the max to deal with COVID. So, but it's not an un unlimited pot of dollars. So I think every level of government has to be creative in dealing with the crises they have to at hand, especially in the healthcare system. Seniors, opioid crisis, mental health, right. us, all the so, other usual things that we do. Kate, let me come back to, to the leadership issue here. How, how much of a challenge does Aaron O'Toole face in holding the Liberals to account on all of these issues we're talking about, given uh, the internal leadership problems and challenges he's facing from Conservatives? Honestly, I think a lot of that internal party politics uh, is, is going to subside now that the House is back and people are focused. Uh, there's a number of pretty big major issues that require scrutiny from the official opposition, and they need to be working as, as one team in order to, to get it done. So, um, you know, a favorite conservative pastime is airing the dirty laundry. I think that we're going to see a little bit less of that and a little more focus uh, where it needs to be uh, now that the parliament is finally back and sitting and debating these things. Uh, one thing I would kind of remind viewers is that 2019, the big theme in that speech was Western alienation. Uh, I don't think that the government can credibly say uh, that that problem is fixed or a box ticked there, uh, even if they picked up a couple of seats in Alberta. Um, so I'm wondering uh, to what degree we might see the Prime Minister through his speech today uh, acknowledge that there are still a lot of big divisions regionally in Canada. Um, you know, even Saskatchewan is floating the idea out there around some separate powers that they may have, which Quebec already has. So trying to thread that needle uh, and acknowledge that challenge in the West, uh, despite picking up some seats, I think is going to be really important for the Prime Minister to echo again in this in this speech. All right, Danielle, let, let me finish up uh, with you on this. And th this is the, the longer term question of uh, lots of talk in Ottawa and, and confirmed by New Democrats that there are, and Liberals, ongoing discussions about uh, some sort of arrangement uh, that would see uh, uh, Liberals and New Democrats agree, uh, agree to cooperate on sort of key votes with a view to keeping a minority government in power. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, will New Democrats welcome that? And do you think that's the right position for New Democrats to take? I do. In this case, it's going to be largely cooperation at a House level to pass legislation, which I think is a practical solution that people will support. Um, I think a coalition, uh, which was a conversation uh, many people were having, although I, I'm not sure that the Prime Minister and and Jigmeet Singh were actually having uh, for a while in Ottawa. I don't think that that serves anybody. I'm actually of the rare belief that minority parliaments uh, can work very well for Canadians. So I think striking that balance of facilitating efficient delivery of services and programs that Canadians really need right now with um, making sure that they're also 
able to use their leverage when they need to uh, to, to fight for the things that, that they think are important that the government is missing. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that for today. Uh, Susan Smith, Kate Harrison, and uh, Danielle Delzell, uh, thank you all for joining me this morning. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk again. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thanks. All right, let me show you the scene. Uh, the, these uh, images you've been, uh, you're watching here, we'll uh, show them to you of uh, outside the uh, Senate building in downtown Ottawa, just a couple of blocks down from Parliament Hill, directly across from that landmark hotel, the Chateau Laurier. As things begin to get underway uh, on the Senate side, these are, it's sort of a dueling process here, House of Commons and Senate. We'll show you what we can as the process unfolds in the Senate, then we'll pop back to the uh, House of Commons when it, uh, uh, begins its activities, which will involve uh, the gentleman usher of the Black Rod uh, going to the House of Commons and drawing, uh, asking MPs to uh, come down to the Senate, and a handful of them will, uh, to hear the speech from the throne. Uh, more than uh, we saw in, in the last uh, in the last speech from the throne, or, or more than have typically gathered at the Senate here during the, the pandemic timing. So. Uh, we now see the House of Commons is back up, so let's go to the House of Commons as we uh, watch the uh, procedures unfold here. Um, John. 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 I'm getting the, I'm getting a mic. I'm getting a mic, yeah. Governor General of Canada and Mr. Wick Grant Fraser will arrive at the Senate of Canada building at 12.15 third day of November 2021. When it has been indicated that all in readiness her Excellency the Governor-General will proceed to the Chamber of the Senate to formally open the first session of the 44th Parliament of Canada. Yours sincerely, Ian McCowan. J'ai l'honneur d'informer à la Chambre d'une communication. I have the honour to inform the House that a communication has been received as follows. November 17th, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I have the honour to inform you that Their Excellencies, the Right Honourable Mary Mae Simon, Governor-General of Canada, and Mr. Whit Grant Fraser will arrive at the Senate of Canada building at 12.15 p.m. on Tuesday, the 23rd day of November 2021, when it has been indicated that all is in readiness. Her Excellency, the Governor-General, will proceed to the Chamber of the Senate to formally open the first session of the 44th Parliament of Canada. Yours sincerely, Ian McCowan. Okay.
sun, the sun has a warmth, eh? A little bit, yeah. And I'm the PEI warmth. And I'm the PEI warmth. Oh, yeah, come on over here, please. Yes, please. please. Gardener, à l'épaule Gardener, à votre gouverneur général, salut royal, présenté Left wing.
Please be seated. Veye vous asseyor. Boussier du Bâton Noir, rendez-vous à la Chambre des communes et informez-la que c'est le plaisir de son excellence, le gouverneur général, que les communes se rendent immédiatement auprès d'elle dans la salle du Sénat.
A message from Her Excellency the Governor General. A message from Her Excellency the Governor General. Admit the messenger. Faites entrer le messager. Mr. Speaker, a message from Her Excellency the Governor General, Monsieur le Président, a message to Son Excellence la Governor General. The messenger. The members can sit down. Hmm? Mr. Speaker, it is the pleasure of Her Excellency the Governor General that this honorable House attend her immediately in the Chamber of the Senate. Monsieur le Président, c'est le plaisir de Son Excellence le Governor General que cette honorable Chambre se rende immediately auprès d'elle dans la salle du Senat.
May it please your excellency, the House of Commons has elected me their speaker. Though I am but little able to fulfill the important duties thus assigned to me. If the performance of those duties, I should at any time fall into error, I pray that the fault may be inputted on me and on the commons, whose servant I am, and whom, through me, the better to enable them to discharge their duty to their queen and country, humbly claim all their undoubted rights and privileges, especially that they may have freedom of speech in their debates, access to your excellency's person at all seasonable times, and that their proceedings may receive from your excellency your ex the most favorable construction. May it please your excellency. The House of Commons has elected me their speaker, though I am but little able to fulfill the important duties thus assigned to me. If, in the performance of those duties, I should at any time fall into error, I pray that the fault may be imputed to me and not to the Commons, whose servant, servant I am, and who, through me, the better to enable them to discharge their duty to their Queen and country, humbly claim all their undoubted rights and privileges, especially that may have the free, they have the free, especially that they may have freedom of speech in their debates, access to your excellency's person at all seasonable times, and that and that their proceedings may receive from your excellency the most favorable construction. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, I am commanded by Her Excellency, the Governor General, to declare to you that she freely confides in the duty and attachment of the House of Common to Her Majesty's person and government, and not doubting that their proceedings will be conducted with wisdom, temper, and prudence, she grants, and upon all occasions will recognize and allow their constitutional privileges. I am commanded also to assure you that the Commons shall have ready access to Her Excellency upon all seasonable occasions and that their proceedings as well as your words and actions will constantly receive from her the most favorable construction. Mr. Speaker, I am commanded by Her Excellency the Governor General to declare to you that she freely confides in the duty and attachment of the House of Commons to Her Majesty's person and government and not doubting that their proceedings will be conducted with wisdom, temper, and prudence. She grants and upon all occasions will recognize and allow their constitutional privileges. I am commanded also to assure you that the Commons shall have ready access to Her Excellency upon all seasonable occasions and that their proceedings, as well as your words and actions, will constantly receive from her the most favorable construction. Have a good afternoon. 
Congratulations to each of you and welcome to the new parliamentarians who will together with their colleagues make their mark on Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. This land acknowledgement is not a symbolic declaration. It is our true history. In each of your own writings, I encourage you to seek out the truth and to learn about the, li of, about the lived realities in First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. Although each community is distinct, we all share a desire to chart a way forward together towards reconciliation. La découverte. The discovery of unmarked graves of children who died in the residential school system shows how the actions of governments and institutions of the past have devastated Indigenous peoples and continue to impact them today. We cannot hide from these discoveries. They open deep wounds. Despite the profound pain, there is hope. Already, I have seen how Canadians are committed to reconciliation. Indigenous peoples are reclaiming our history, stories, culture, and language through action. Non-Indigenous peoples are coming to understand and accept the true impact of the past and the pain suffered by generations of Indigenous peoples. Together, they are walking the path towards reconciliation. Turn the guilt we carry into action. Action on reconciliation. Action on our collective health and well-being. Action on climate change. We must turn the guilt we carry into action. Action on reconciliation. Action on our collective health and well-being. Action on climate change. We must turn the guilt we carry into action. Action on reconciliation. Action on our collective health and well-being. Action on climate change. Our Earth is in danger from a warming Arctic to the increasing devastation of natural disasters. Our land and our people need help. We must move talk into action and adapt where we must. We cannot afford to wait.
from the grief and pain of residential schools to the fear of threats to our natural environment to the profound impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. This year has been hard on all of us. I want to thank all the workers across Canada, especially those in healthcare, for their efforts to keep us safe and healthy and offer my deepest condolences to those who have experienced loss and loved ones during the pandemic. It has touched us all, including those in this chamber who lost a cherished colleague just a few days ago, Senator Forrest Nissing. Jafra Asa. To her family and to all of you, my deepest sympathies. The pandemic has shown us that we need to put a focus on mental health in the same way as physical well being because they are inseparable. As you begin this 44th Parliament of Canada, And as we recover from the effects of the pandemic and build a better relationship between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples, I urge you to transform discussion into concrete results for us and for our country. Now let's see a little look. Collaborate with and listen to each other. Who speak a multitude of languages and who shape this country. Listen to the diverse voices who speak a multitude of languages and who shape this country. Confronting the hard questions will not always be easy or comfortable, and it will require conviction, but it is necessary. The outcome will be a sustainable, United Canada for you, for me, for our children, and for every generation to come. As we speak, British Columbians are facing immeasurable challenges as their homes, their communities, and their well-being are impacted by terrible flooding. But in a time of crisis, we know how Canadians respond. We step up and we are there for each other. And the government will continue to be there for the people of British Columbia. In 2020, the Canadians did not know they would face the crisis of a once-in-a-century pandemic. But as always, no one should be surprised by how Canadians responded. We adapted. We helped one another and we stayed true to our values. Values like compassion, courage, and determination. Values like democracy. And in this difficult time, Canadians made a democratic choice. Their direction is clear. Not only do they want parliamentarians to work together to put this pandemic behind us, they also want bold, concrete solutions to meet other challenges that we face. Growing an economy that works for everyone, 
fighting climate change, moving forward on a path of reconciliation, making sure our communities are safe, healthy, and inclusive. Yes, the decade got off to an incredibly difficult start, but this is the time to rebuild. This is the moment for parliamentarians to work together to get big things done and shape a better future for our kids. C'est le moment. This is the moment to build a healthier today and tomorrow. Priority number one remains getting the pandemic under control. The best way to do that is vaccination. Already, the government has mandated vaccinations for federal and federally regulated workers and for everyone traveling within Canada by plane, train or ship. It has also ensured a standardized Canadian proof of vaccination for domestic and international use. The government is securing next generation COVID-19 vaccines, boosters and doses for kids from 5 to 11. And around the world, Canada will continue working with its partners to ensure fair and equitable access to vaccines and other resources. To build a healthy, healthy future, we must also strengthen our health care system and public health supports for all Canadians, especially seniors, veterans, persons with disabilities, vulnerable members of our communities, and those who have faced discrimination by the very system that is meant to heal. There is work to be done on accessibility, on care in rural communities, on delayed procedures, on mental health and addictions treatment, on long-term care, on improving data collection across health systems to inform future decisions and get the best possible results. The government will work collaboratively with provinces, territories, and other partners to deliver real results on what Canadians need. This is the moment to grow a more resilient economy. The best thing we can do for the economy remains ending, ending the pandemic for good. But as we do, we should rebuild an economy that works for everyone. At the height of the lockdowns, the government made historic, necessary inv investments so families could keep paying the rent and small businesses could stay afloat. Now, with one of the most successful vaccination campaigns in the world and employment back to pre-pandemic levels, the government is moving to more targeted support while prudently managing spending. To ensure no one is left behind, support will be extended or added for industries that continue to struggle. At the same time, the government will also continue making life more affordable for all Canadians. Inflation is a challenge that countries around the world are facing. And while, Can and while Canada's economic performance is better than many of our partners, we must keep tackling the, the rising cost of living. To do that, the government's plan includes two major priorities, housing and childcare. Whether it is building more units per year, increasing affordable housing, or ending chronic homelessness, the government is committed to working with its partners, partners to get real results. For example, the Housing Accelerator Fund will help municipalities build more and better faster. 
The government will also help families buy their first home sooner with a more flexible first-time home buyer's incentive, a new rent-to-own program, and by reducing the closing costs for first-time buyers. Supporting families will make life more affordable for the middle class and people working hard to join it. The Canada Child Benefit has already helped lift hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty and will continue increasing to keep up with the cost of living. The government will also continue building the first ever Canada-wide early learning <coughs> and child care system. By the end of 2022, average fees for regulated child care will be cut in half in most of the provinces and territories. And in some places, this will even happen as early as the start of the year. Families will save thousands of dollars. Four jurisdictions have not yet reached agreements on child care. Two are territories with unique infrastructure challenges, and the government will keep working together to ensure we meet the needs of the North. The government will continue working with the remaining two provinces to finalize agreements that will deliver $10 a day child care for families who so badly need it. Investing in affordable child care, just like housing, is not just good for families. It helps grow the entire economy, and so does immigration. That is why the government will continue increasing immigration levels and reducing wait times, while supporting family reunification and delivering a world-leading refugee resettlement program. This is the moment for bolder climate action. Building a resilient economy means investing in people, but the work does not stop here. After all, growing the economy and protecting the environment go hand in hand. By focusing on innovation and good green jobs and by working with like-minded countries, we will build a more resilient, sustainable and competitive economy. As a country, we want to be leaders in producing the world's cleanest steel, aluminum, building products, cars and planes. Not only do we have the raw materials and energy to do that, most importantly, we have skilled, hardworking Canadians to power these industries. As we move forward on the economy of the future, no worker or region will be left behind. The government will bring together provinces, territories, and municipalities, and indigenous communities, as well as labor and the private sector, to tap into global capital and attract investors. Canada will emerge from this generational challenge stronger and more prosperous. Le gouvernement. The government is taking real action to fight climate change. Now we must go further, faster. That means moving to cap and cut oil and gas sector emissions while accelerating our path to a 100 percent net zero electricity future. Investing in public transit and mandating the sale of zero emissions, via emission via emissions vehicles will help us breathe cleaner air. Increasing the price on pollution while putting more money back in Canadians' pockets will deliver a cleaner environment and a stronger economy. Protecting our land and oceans will address biodiversity loss. 
In this work, the government will continue to strengthen its partnerships with First Nations, Inuit and Métis, to protect nature and respect their traditional knowledge. Creating the Canada Water Agency will safeguard that vital source and support our farmers. And to address the realities communities across the country already face, the government will also strengthen action to prevent and prepare for floods, wildflowers, wildfires, droughts, coastline erosion, and other extreme weather worsened by climate change. The government will be there to build back in communities devastated by these events. This will include the development of Canada's first ever national adaptation strategy. While we address climate change, while we, while we fight COVID-19 and its consequences, while we grow our economy for everyone, we cannot turn away from other challenges. Order for safer communities. While we address climate change, while we fight COVID-19 and its consequences, while we grow our economy for everyone, we cannot turn away from other challenges. Gun violence is on the rise in many of our biggest cities. While investing in prevention and supporting the work of law enforcement, we must also continue to strengthen gun control. The government has taken important actions like introducing lifetime background checks. The government will now put forward measures like a mandatory buyback of banned assault-style weapons and move forward with any province or territory that wants to ban handguns. During the pandemic, we have also seen an unacceptable rise in violence against women and girls. The government is committed to moving forward with a 10-year national action plan on gender-based violence and will continue to support organizations providing critical services. When someone in our country is targeted because of their gender, or who they love, or where they come from, the way they pray, the language they speak, or the color of their skin, we are all diminished. Everyone should be and feel safe. The government will continue combating hate and racism, including with a renewed anti-racism strategy. This is the moment to stand up for diversity and inclusion. Canada, Canadians understand that equity, justice, and diversity are the means and the ends to living together. Fighting systemic racism, sexism, discrimination, misconduct, and abuse, and in, including in our core institutions, will remain a key priority. The government will also continue to reform the criminal justice system and policing. This is the moment to rebuild for everyone. The government will continue to invest in the empowerment of black and racialized Canadians and indigenous peoples. It will also continue to fight harmful content online stand and stand up for LGBTQ2 communities while completing the ban on conversion therapy. La du langues officielles. As Canadians, our two official languages are part of who we are. 
it is essential to support official language minority communities and to protect and promote French outside and inside Quebec. The government will reintroduce the proposed Act for the Substantive Equality of French and English and the Strengthening of the Official Languages Act. To support Canadian culture and creative industries, the government will also reintroduce legislation to reform the Broadcasting Act and ensure web giants pay for their fair share for the creation and promotion of Canadian content. This is the moment to move faster on the path of reconciliation. This year, Canadians were horrified by the discovery of unmarked graves at former residential schools. We know that reconciliation cannot come without truth. As the government continues to respond to the calls to action, it will invest in that truth, including with the creation of a national monument to honour survivors and with the appointment of a special interlocutor to further advance justice on residential schools. To support communities, the government will also invest significantly in a distinction-based mental health and wellness strategy guided by Indigenous peoples, survivors and their families. Everyone in our country deserves to be safe. That is why the government will accelerate work with Indigenous partners to address the national tragedy of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and 2SLBTQQIA plus people. The government will also make sure communities have the support they need to keep their families together while ensuring fair and equitable compensation for those harmed by the First Nations Child and Family Services Program. Reconciliation requires a whole of government approach, breaking down barriers and re rethinking how to accelerate our work whether it is eliminating all remaining long-term drinking water advisories or implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the government is committed to closing the gaps that far too many First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities still face today. This is the moment to fight for a secure, just, and equitable world. The last 19 months have underscored that we live in a deeply interconnected world. Canada must stand up on the pressing challenges of our time through our own commitments and by increasing our engagement with international partners, coalitions, and organizations. In the face of rising authoritarianism and great power competition, Canada must reinforce international peace and security, the rule of law, democracy, and respect for human rights. Canada's prosperity and middle-class jobs depend on preserving and expanding open rules-based trade and ensuring our supply chains are strong and resilient. At home, the government will continue to protect Canadians from threats to our communities, our society, and our democracy. A changing world requires adapting and expanding diplomatic engagement. Canada will continue working with key allies and partners while making deliberate efforts to deepen partnerships in the Indo-Pacific and across the Arctic. Increasing Canada's foreign assistance, 
budget each year and investing in sustainable, equitable, and feminist development that benefits the world's most vulnerable and promotes gender equality will continue to be priorities. We will always stand up for a brighter future for all. Le Disney. This decade is still young, with compassion, courage, and determination. We have the power to make it better than how it started. But that can only happen by standing together. Parliamentarians, never before has so much depended on your ability to deliver results for Canada. That is what people expect and need from you. In relation to ending this pandemic, their priorities for this 44th Parliament are clear. A more resilient economy and a cleaner and healthier future for all of our kids. I do not doubt that you will honour the trust that has been placed in you. Members of the House of Commons, you will be asked to appropriate the funds to carry out the services and expenditures authorised by Parliament. Members of the Senate and members of the House of Commons, may you be equal to the profound trust bestowed on you by Canadians, and may divine providence guide you in all your duties. Thank you. Merci. Miigwech. Anakokmik.
Hello again, I'm Peter Van Dusen. Uh, we have uh, witnessed now the delivering of the speech from th uh, the throne. Uh, what you can see in the, your images now is that uh, members of parliament who were summoned to the uh, chamber of the Senate for the speech from the throne uh, are now going to make their way back to the House of Commons where they will uh, uh, deal with some procedural matters around the speech from the throne, some uh, relatively brief replies, uh, initial replies to the speech from the throne and so the process will uh, continue uh, there in the next few minutes and we'll uh, join the House when that gets underway. Uh, but the speech from the throne itself delivered by Canada's first Indigenous Governor General Mary Simon, you heard uh, parts of that speech uh, delivered in Inuktitut uh, as well as uh, French language, a lot of uh, people wanting uh, to hear Mary Simon uh, speak French, a lot of concerns around the fact that uh, she was appointed to the position, uh, named to the position, uh, and she is not bilingual, uh, has vowed to work on her French, but uh, a fair bit of this speech was delivered in the French language. A speech delivered on behalf of the government, as all throne speeches are, and this one focused on a pledge from the Liberal minority government to deliver on the commitments made during the recent election campaign. Uh, focusing on the need for a cooperation in Parliament as well, uh, it promises action uh, to continue the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to carry Canada through it uh, to end the pandemic, and, uh, but continue for the time being supports for Canadians. In some cases, those supports being dialed back, and we'll be hearing more about that in the days ahead, but in some cases, those supports extended to individuals and businesses that continue to be hard hit by the pandemic. Uh, a promise of more um, aggressive progress and action on uh, climate change and dealing with that and uh, the timeliness of that conversation and that uh, mention in the speech given uh, what we are witnessing in the province of British Columbia with uh, massive storms there and massive damage from those storms. Uh, big storms hitting the east coast of Canada today as well. So uh, a need for um, a call uh, for a continuing a, you know, a progress on climate change action and a pledge to take more urgent action and uh, bring in uh, measures to deal with climate. Uh, reconciliation also featuring prominently in the uh, speech from the throne today, uh, promises to uh, uh, proceed uh, vigorously uh, to try and uh, repair uh, the damaged relationship with Canada's Indigenous people, also to move on uh, measures to improve inclusivity in this country. Also a pledge to improve health care, uh, housing affordability and child care. The government pointing out it still uh, needs to uh, conclude deals with uh, four jurisdictions, two of them territories, two provinces, New Brunswick and Ontario, and promising uh, to pursue those deals and to make that happen. $10 a day child care across the country. Uh, the speech acknowledging the threats from uh, rising inflation as to, uh, as well. Uh, members of the Conservative Party in uh, particular have been pressing the government on uh, this issue of uh, rising inflation and concerns about affordability for Canadians. Uh, the speech from the throne identifies the government is aware of the challenges and uh, will be dealing with those challenges to try and make life more affordable Canadians. And this call I talked about, uh, a, a call on all parliamentarians to do what's right for the country. And this is the, in the context of the Liberals believing that the last election gives them a mandate uh, to proceed with the agenda they want to proceed with. And uh, right at the very end of the speech, you probably heard it, Mary Simon reading, Parliamentarians, never before has so much depended on your ability to deliver results for Canadians. This is what people expect and need from you. Uh, I have no doubt that you will honour the trust that has been placed in you. Members of the House of Commons, you'll be asked to appropriate the funds to carry out the services and expenditures authorised by Parliament. Uh, again, uh, words... Uh, written, uh, delivered by the Governor-General, but written at the hand of the Liberal government, uh, saying that uh, this is a time for all parliamentarians uh, to do what uh, the Liberals believe is right uh, for the country and for Canadians and moving uh, the country forward. Uh, so we will be hearing more about this as the process now moves, as I said, to the House of Commons and uh, members of Parliament uh, drill down a little more on what was said in the speech from the throne in the initial replies and we'll hear initially from uh, uh, typically it would be a, a a new member of the Liberal caucus who will uh, address the House about the speech uh, from the throne and then uh, sort of cursory remarks coming from opposition parties but that uh, the most significant part of the response to the speech from the throne will come in the days ahead uh, from opposition party members 
uh, when they turn, <clears throat> excuse me, their uh, attention on six days of debate, not necessarily successive days, but they'll be turning their attention to that. Uh, what else will the House be, House be dealing with this afternoon? Uh, we are told to expect that the uh, Conservatives will be pressing their case of privilege, uh, asking the Speaker to uh, look into the vaccine mandate ordered for uh, Parliament and uh, the Parliamentary Precinct by the Board of Internal Economy. That's a internal management board of sorts of the uh, House of Commons made up of the Speaker and representatives from each of the uh, uh, political parties in the House of Commons. Uh, that make decisions on the operation of the House of Commons and the parliamentary precinct. And in this case, they took the decision that all MPs would have to be fully vaccinated to attend the House of Commons or that they would have to provide exemptions. Uh, Conservatives uh, say they're following those rules, but take issue with the way those rules were introduced and um, ordered uh, by the Board of Internal Economy, uh, that uh, that uh, infringes on uh, the privileges of uh, some members of the House of Commons. So they'll be taking up that case uh, with the Speaker today. Don't expect a ruling today. The, they would make the case. Other parties can interject. And then uh, the Speaker uh, would take uh, um, the uh, information under advisement and return to the House uh, at a later date uh, with a ruling on that. We also know the government in terms of legislation. Speech from the throne uh, sort of comes in two ways. Oh, we're back in the House of Commons, so uh, let's go back to the House of Commons as they prepare to uh, take us through the next phase of the uh, speech from the throne day and uh, the role now of members of parliament. C'est bon.
Thank you very much. Uh, just a couple of comments before your questions. Uh, in this speech, we heard a lot of real this, real that. It really looked really empty. It was uh, a government that's run out of ideas and run out of steam. We, we see a throne speech that does not respond to the urgency of the crises that we're up against. We've got a housing crisis, no real action to actually improve or tackle the housing crisis. We see um, a lot of, right now, immediate impacts of the climate crisis, but this throne speech doesn't respond to some of the most important, easy first steps, ending fossil fuel subsidies. And we know that Canada is the worst country in the G20 for fossil fuel subsidies. And those are subsidies that are incentivizing fossil fuels instead of going towards helping to incentivize renewable energy. So this is really problematic. To talk about cleaner and healthier, well, it's certainly not healthier. There's no talk about increasing investments in our health care to keep it publicly funded and well-funded. And there's no talk about pharmacare, something that was in their throne speech in the past and they've completely abandoned now. Or dental care, something that we pushed for and was included in previous throne speeches. So it looks like a government's run out of steam and is not responding to the urgency and the problems that people are going through right now. And uh, we are gonna continue to fight for what people want, which is concrete steps to tackle the climate crisis and also a clear plan for workers. Right now, workers are worried about what their futures hold and we want a real plan for workers. That's something that's missing in this as well. Um, donc, uh, ils ont souvent utilisé le mot uh, vrai change, vraies actions. Mais effectivement, c'était vraiment vide. Uh, et ce qu'on a vu, c'est vraiment une, uh, un gouvernement qui n'a pas des idées et qui n'a pas une urgence pour répondre aux besoins des gens. Uh, ils ont parlé de, de santé, mais il n'y a aucun uh, investissement pour notre soin de santé, augmentation des financements pour les provinces, quelque chose qui est essentiel. Ils ont complètement laissé de côté l'idée de l'assurance médicament universelle ou les soins dentaires. Donc, ce n'est pas quelque chose qui répond aux besoins des gens en matière de santé, ni pour l'environnement. Ce qui est tellement important et clair, c'est le fait qu'on doit éliminer les subventions aux entreprises pétrolières. Et dans ce euh, discours du trône, ils ont complètement manqué de parler de ça et on ne voit pas des actions urgentes pour faire face à la crise climatique ou un plan pour les travailleurs et travailleuses qui demandent un plan, qui ont besoin d'un plan depuis longtemps. Il n'y a pas un plan pour dire c'est quoi l'avenir pour les travailleurs dans le secteur d'énergie. Et c'est aussi un autre exemple de comment ce discours de trône manque euh, le coup, manque euh, le but de, de montrer une vraie vision pour euh, l'avenir. On va continuer de se battre pour les gens et proposer des solutions pour faire face aux enjeux qui frappent fort à ce moment pour les Canadiens et Canadiennes et pour les Québécois et Québécoises. Merci et uh, je suis prêt pour vos questions. Same question, so I will answer it in English and French. Um, we, right now, this is not a speech that demonstrates a willingness to work together or uh, shared values about building a better Canada. There is no clarity about whether there will be a vote or not, but uh, we want to make it clear to the Liberals, as we've said in the past, as I've said, don't take our support for granted. This is not a speech that looks like they're interested in working together at this point. So is that a vote? And if there's a vote, if there's a vote, would you vote no in this present moment? Uh, that's something that we're going to discuss and, and reflect on our team, but I want to make it clear they can't take our support for granted, and this isn't a throne speech that looks like they want to work together. So, Oui, oui, j'ai promis de le dire en français, c'est important. Euh, donc, ce discours de trône ne représente pas un euh, une exemple d'une volonté de travail ensemble. Euh, donc, ce qu'ils ont, qu ont mis de l'avant dans ce discours de trône ne me donne pas de, de la confiance qu'ils veulent travailler ensemble. Et comme j'ai dit dans le passé, les libéraux ne peuvent pas prendre pour acquis notre appui. Et ce discours de prendre, c'est ça, ça, ça applique aussi. Confusing, 
the throne speech is supposed to lay out their vision. And of course, I'm not faulting the lack of detail. That's not something that we expect in a throne speech. But we do expect an idea of where this government's going. So they're saying one thing outside of the throne speech, but in the speech itself, it doesn't lay out a similar vision. So it leaves me and leaves Canadians wondering what is their real goal? What is, what is their priority? What are their priorities? And so without having laid out some of those things, it, it raises those legitimate questions. Maybe it is not important to them. And we've often said the Liberals say one thing and do another, and in this case, they've said one thing and then said another. Instead of saying one thing and doing another, they've just said things that, that don't align. So it leaves us wondering if they're really interested in doing the things that Canadians need them to do. speech that you can support? Well, there's things that they've laid out this week that we absolutely support. In fact, we champion. So paid sick leave, for example, is something that we fought for, we pushed for, we raised 22 times in the past 18 months, each time the Liberals shot it down, and now they finally want to bring it in. We would have brought in uh, legislated paid sick leave when people needed it most in the, in the, in the heat or the heart of the pandemic. But some, absolutely something that we would support and we would pass very quickly. We believe in, in their uh, suggestions and we, we've advocated for this and we fought for this, protecting frontline healthcare workers. That's something that we support, of course. And banning conversion therapy, of course. These are things that we support and would support in moving fast, uh, rapidly through the House. So there are things that we agree on. But I also want to make it clear there's things we don't agree. So far, their plan for the pandemic supports is going to cut help to people without an alternative, without fixing the EI, for example, which doesn't cover 60% of Canadians. So they've, they've cut or they're proposing to cut help without any fixes. And so that's something we won't support at this point. What's the one thing you need to see in the speech in order for you to support it then? Well, we laid out a lot of priorities, and we said we want to see action on the climate crisis, we want to see a real plan for workers, we said we want to see investments in health care, uh, and so they're missing a lot of things. They, we would have been happy with, with any sort of real concrete action on the climate crisis, but they haven't really put that forward. Fossil fuel subsidies is a big one. It came up in COP26. I wasn't there. For, the, for health care, it's pretty clear we've been long-time champions of pharmacare and dental care. Neither of those were in the throne speech. So it, it shows they're not interested in working together. Before the, election, you were, before the election, you were prepared to support the Liberals to avoid an election, to avoid a confidence vote. Are you taking a different approach during this parliamentary session? Because you're already suggesting you might not vote for the throne speech, potentially bringing down the minority government. What we said b before is that we want to make this parliament work for Canadians. And that remains our goal. We want to make this parliament work for Canadians. We respect that Canadians sent us here in a minority government. But we don't want the Liberals to think that, we're gonna, that our support can be taken for granted. Not at all. If they want to work to help people, we will pass bills that help people. If they want to hurt people, cut their support, they can go to the Conservatives or the Bloc. We're not going to help in passing laws that make life worse for people. Okay. Uh, si, uh, comme j'ai dit, uh, je veux que ce gouvernement, ce, ce parlement, fonctionne pour les gens. Je respecte le fait que les, les, les Canadiens, Canadiennes, les Québécois, et Québécoises ont choisi un gouvernement minoritaire. Donc, notre travail, c'est de s'assurer que ce gouvernement minoritaire fonctionne pour les gens. Donc, uh, si le gouvernement, les libéraux, veut présenter un projet de loi qui aide les gens, on sera là pour, euh, pour euh, faire passer un projet de loi qui aide les gens. Mais si elle veut passer un projet de loi qui va nuire ou faire mal aux gens, c'est quelque chose qui peut trouver l'appui des conservateurs ou les blocs, mais pas de nous. Monsieur Singh, Monsieur Singh, s'il vous plaît en français, concernant le, le projet de loi sur les programmes d'aide liés à la COVID, qu'est-ce qui manque pour que le NPD l'appuie concrètement? Est-ce que vous avez des attentes précises? Oui. Donc, euh, deux éléments. Un, c'est à ce moment, ils vont couper l'aide aux gens et on sait qu'on est toujours dans une pandémie. Il y a toujours des gens qui ne peuvent pas retourner au travail. Sinon, euh, on, a, on a besoin d'un changement pour de, de la science emploi pour garantir que les 60 des Canadiens qui, à ce moment, ne sont pas couverts par euh, la science emploi sont couverts. Donc, ce changement ou euh, de régler le fait qu'à ce moment, nos aînés vulnérables font face à une réduction de l'aide à cause du fait qu'ils ont reçu la PSU dans le passé. Aussi, les, les, les familles qui reçoivent l'aide canadienne pour les enfants, aussi 
font face à une réduction de l'aide. Donc, avec cette, euh, ces deux cas, s'ils ne sont pas réglés, c'est pourquoi on est contre euh, leur proposition pour euh, changer l'aide aux gens. In the alternative, without the alternative of having fixed EI or fixed some of the clawbacks, and so we can't uh, support a bill that's going to hurt people that way. Concernant la, les motions d'allocation de temps pour raccourcir les débats sur les autres projets de loi, est-ce que c'est quelque chose que vous envisageriez et pour quel projet de loi, s'il vous plaît? J'ai manqué le début de votre okay. question. Est-ce que vous seriez prêt à appuyer une motion d'allocation de temps pour raccourcir les débats euh, sur les autres projets de loi et si oui, lesquels, s'il vous plaît, en français? Uh, les, les projets de loi comme uh, l'introduction de thérapie conversion, uh, les congés des maladies payées, oui. Uh, pour les autres, non. I just want to go back to what you're saying about um, how you can't fault them for not putting in many details today, but at the same time, there's all these things missing that you would have liked to have seen to get their support. So, what goes on next for the NDP? I mean, are you actually going to withdraw any support? Is that really realistic here? Uh, absolutely. We, we've said from the beginning that our support should not be taken for granted. Uh, this is a document that lays out a vision. I don't need a 10-point plan, but the fact that they're completely abandoned pharmacare, they campaigned on it in 2019, it's not that long ago, they brought it up in their throne speech, and just a couple years later it's completely absent. So their vision for healthcare does not align with our vision, which is to invest in healthcare. They don't mention increasing the, the financing for, or the transfers in healthcare at all. That's something that all the provinces have come together and agreed needs to happen, and we agree needs to happen. We've talked about any fossil fuel subsidies, it's not there. Uh, we talked about concrete action, given the fact that we're dealing with a climate crisis uh, caused flooding in BC and the devastation of that, we want to see real action, it's not there. So this is not, this is not a vision that, that is in line with what people need and what, what we want to help with people. You want to follow up and then go there? Why did you then say a few weeks ago when we were all asking you about whether you'd, have su you'd support the Liberals when you didn't even know what was going to be in their throne speech then? So now you, s you said you'd give them support, then you get the throne speech and you don't like it. I just feel like we often hear you say not to take their, your support for granted, but you know we've seen that in the last couple of parliaments and then generally the NDP ends up supporting them anyway. So you know, um, how can you know, Canadians actually expect to believe that you are going to withdraw your support? We voted against the Liberals a number of times in the, in the Parliament. We voted against the throne speech uh, in the past, and we're prepared to do it again. Uh, we want to be really clear. We have said our goal, though, is not to arbitrarily find ways to tear down government. We want to make this government work for people. That is our goal, and that will always be our goal. We are open to working together, but I've been very clear. I, I don't want the Liberals to think that our desire to work together in making the Parliament work for people means they can take our support for granted. We just want to listen to what Canadians sent us here to do, which is get to work, help us out, make life better for us, make this minority government work for us. That's what we're committed to doing, but that does not mean that our support should be taken for granted. Just to to John, Mr. To Singh. Is that a new is that a new one? No. Okay. Oh yeah, j'ai dit que oui, oui, oui. Est-ce que le gouvernement devrait tomber à la suite de ce discours du trône là que vous jugez insatisfaisant? Je pense qu'il y a des autres partis qui vont appuyer euh, ces mesures parce que c'est pour eux peut-être satisfait, satisfait. Mais pour nous, on a été clair, on, on a présenté plusieurs choses où on a voulu voir des engagements. Et ce discours de trône ne montre pas euh, un engagement pour euh, répondre aux besoins des Canadiens. Et j'ai montré, montré comment, parce que ça ne répond pas aux, aux urgences de crise climatique, de la crise du logement un plan pour les travailleurs, euh, on n'a pas des augmentations pour euh, le financement pour la santé, donc plusieurs problèmes. Encore. D'autres partis vont sûrement appuyer le discours de trône, lesquels et pourquoi eux l'appuieraient si vous, vous ne l'appuyez pas? Oh, c'est à eux de décider, mais j'ai dit que si les libéraux veulent travailler avec nous, on est toujours prêt. 
mais ce discours de trône ne montre pas une volonté de travailler ensemble. Donc, on n'a on a pas pris une décision de comment on va voter, mais j'ai dit que ce n'est pas un discours de tronc qui, qui montre une volonté de travailler ensemble. Et on va parler votre, avec notre équipe et décider s'il y a un vote, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire. Assure you that their promises that they've made outside of the throne speech are in fact promises that they are willing to keep. What what exactly needs to happen? Well, they know that what our priorities are, and if, if the liberals are interested in, in getting our support, they can always reach out and, and have a conversation about things that we want to see happen. We want to see action on the housing crisis. We want to see action on the climate crisis. Help to municipalities that are hard hit by extreme weather. We want to see investments in healthcare, pharmacare. There's lots of things they know that we care about. And we want to fight for people. We want to make life better for people. So if they're willing to do any of these things, we can have a conversation. Perhaps for the specifics, though, is, is, pharma, is the NDP support of the throne speech contingent on pharmacare? Uh, our support for any bill is contingent on whether it's going to help people or not. And so far, this vision is not one that's going to make life better for people in a meaningful way. You're also offering no specifics. So is it contingent on pharmacare? Because you seem like you don't want to answer that question, and you say you care about it a lot. We, we've laid out a number of things that we care about. And if the Liberals want to work with us, they know what we care about. We care about housing. People are right now desperate to find homes. We care about the climate crisis. We're ready to, to fight to make sure we're doing our part. We care about a plan for workers. There's lots of things we care about. Uh, if they want to work with us, we are ready to do the work necessary to make life better for Canadians. And we've laid out a number of priorities that they can work with us on. Thank you. I'm again. Sorry, merci. Thank you. Mais quel aménagement intéressant! Bien le bonjour tout le monde. Votre aménagement est beaucoup plus intéressant que le discours du trône, soit dit en passant, parce que je présume que de votre contenu, il y aura quelque chose à dire, et du discours du trône, il n'y a pas grand-chose. Euh, D'abord, euh, permettez-moi l'expression, mais j'ai l'impression que les Canadiens et les Québécois ont élu un gouvernement qui est déjà usé à sa première journée. Le discours du trône contient des mots-clés. Ailleurs, on dirait des « buzzwords ». Alors, on dit « changement climatique », on dit « arme à feu », on dit « sortie de pandémie », on dit « relance économique », on dit « autochtone ». Puis après ça, il n'y a plus rien à dire. Il y a un assemblage de 24 pages de mots creux à double interligne. Même lu lentement, le discours du trône est court. Ça m'amène à une conclusion… Euh, un peu plate. Je n'ai aucune raison de voter pour le discours du trône. Je n'ai aucune raison de voter contre le discours du trône. Parce que si, normalement, un discours du trône n'est pas supposé élaborer le détail des intentions législatives du gouvernement, il est supposé, au moins, nous donner un aperçu des intentions du gouvernement et là, on n'en sait pas davantage qu'une espèce de continuité thématique de ce qui se passait lors de la dernière législature, d'une part. Et d'autre part, on se dit, encore une fois, tout ça pour ça. On a fermé le Parlement il y a cinq mois, on est allé en élection il y a plus de trois mois, on a voté il y a deux mois, et ça a pris deux mois pour écrire ça. C'est un travail de cégep d'une demi-journée. Alors, je suis sous l'impression que... C'est décevant, mais je reste convaincu, parce qu'on le fait dans le passé, notamment dans la dernière législature, qu'on peut améliorer les choses en intervenant subséquemment. On peut améliorer les choses en changeant des lois, en déposant nos propres lois, en négociant avec le gouvernement minoritaire, puis en faisant des gains pour le Québec, et c'est ce qu'on essaiera de faire. Je m'abstiens du bien, là. Puis j'avais rencontré euh, la gouvernante générale il y a quelques semaines, euh, puis je savais qu'elle était capable de s'exprimer en français. Euh, le commentaire qu'on avait fait sur la nomination de Mme Simon n'était pas relatif 
au fait qu'elle parle plus ou moins bien le français, mais que le premier ministre était responsable, lui, d'avoir sélectionné une gouverneure générale qui ne parlait pas français. Vous allez voter pour ou contre ce, ce discours du On trône? On va voter pour le discours du trône, parce qu'on si ne peut pas voter contre la tarte aux pommes. En même temps, euh, parce que votre leader parlementaire parlait des priorités qu'il voulait entendre dans le discours du trône. Mm -hmm. La première, c'était la hausse des transferts en santé. Non seulement, on ne parle pas de hausse spécifiquement, mais en plus, on parle… Collaborer, des, des, avec, collaborer les avec les provinces. Pour, euh, non, on, ça pourra vouloir dire une chose et son contraire. Ouais. Ça peut vouloir dire euh, « nous allons collaborer avec les provinces dans le sens de nous allons avoir une discussion, un échange avec les provinces, comme s'il fallait qu'il y ait du donnant-donnant », alors que le rôle du fédéral se limite à faire une contribution financière longuement attendue. Mais on pourrait aussi dire, parce que c'est peut-être ce que les provinces et le Québec vont avoir envie de dire, c'est « Ah, bien, collaborer, ça veut dire qu'ils vont se mettre à nous écouter. » C'est tellement vague que c'est dur d'avoir une opinion sur cette vacuité dans le discours du trône. Maintenant, fiez-vous sur nous, là, c'est une question d'heure avant qu'on pose des questions beaucoup plus claires que ce que ce texte-là suggère. Concernant le choix de loi de mesures d'aide de la COVID, est-ce que vous allez l'appuyer? Qu'est-ce qu'il manquerait pour l'appuyer? Le projet de loi tel qu'il est libellé permet à la ministre d'ajouter des secteurs et de modifier les programmes à la suite de l'adoption de la loi. Et le ministre Rodriguez a euh, établi clairement qu'il est en mesure de mettre en place un programme pour le secteur culturel. Euh, donc, nous, on va voter en faveur de ces deux. May I just ask in English on the um, legislation that Christia Freeland is promising on scaling back COVID-19 benefits, will you be supporting that legislation? We will be supporting that because uh, it contains uh, some decisions can be made after the adoption of the law. Uh, this is a prerogative of the minister and the discussions that we have quite openly with uh, Mrs. Freeland suggest strongly that some changes could be made afterwards. Uh, and uh, about the workers of the uh, cultural sector, we understand that Mr. Rodriguez is coming with something. What about the throne speech, sir? Will you be supporting the throne speech when it comes to a vote? The what? The, the, the speech from the throne. Will you support we that? Will, uh, supporting might not be the best word. We will live with this empty piece of paper, gently read in three languages. I did not comment on the quality of her French before. I won't today. I had a meeting with her a few weeks ago. It was very interesting. We discussed a lot about the Inuit issues. Uh, and I, I saw that she, uh, she understands and speaks French rather well. Uh, the point is not that she does or does not speak French for or by herself. It's because the prime minister sent a strange message to all French Canadians and Quebecers when he selected a uh, governor general which does not, whom does not speak French. What were some more of the things that you would have wanted to have seen in the throne speech today so that it would be more than an empty piece of paper? We would have wanted a strong commitment. Uh, we suggested actually a summit on the financing of health care instead of simply closing doors with uh, prime ministers behind the doors and getting out of there saying we did not agree. This discussion could be held publicly with all prime ministers, health ministers, uh, leader of, of opposition, opposition parties, and then everybody would be in a situation, first of all, all of you, to understand what are the points and arguments and intents of everybody. It seems not to have been uh, accepted as an idea, uh, therefore we got this big nothing. Uh, we will... Uh, come very shortly, it's a matter of hours, before we come with some questions requiring answer much, much more clear than this uh, text which could have been written by a college student. Chef, vous dites que vous ne pouvez pas voter contre une tarte aux pommes. Qu'est-ce qui ferait que le, le dessert serait meilleur pour vous? Écoutez, on pourrait rajouter un petit peu de sucre, un petit peu de saveur, peut-être même un petit peu de pomme. Le problème, c'est que euh, ce texte-là ne contient pas des orientations le moindrement intelligibles. Normalement, un discours du trône dit « voici où est-ce qu'on va s'en aller ». C'est à mi-chemin entre des engagements électoraux vagues et une loi précise. Euh, or, ce, dans ce cas-ci, c'est encore moins clair que les propos de la campagne électorale. On comprend très bien qu'en matière de changement climatique, il ne faut pas que plafonner les émissions du secteur pétrolier, mais bien plafonner la production 
Parce qu'ultimement, il n'y aura pas de réduction des émissions si on augmente la production pour compenser. Ça semble être le, le piège qui nous est tendu avec, en plus, du financement prétendument pour baisser les émissions de gaz à effet de serre de la part d'un gouvernement qui a dit qu'il allait arrêter de, de financer l'industrie du pétrole. Fait que c'est deux, deux mauvais coups pour le prix d'un. Évidemment, le discours du trône ne précise pas ça. J'espère que M. Guilbeault ne se sera pas entraîné dans cette piste douteuse. Euh, en matière de relance, de, de programme de relance, on en a déjà parlé, ça, ça se passe assez bien. Euh, en matière de contrôle des armes à feu, le rachat obligatoire est un engagement électoral clair, allons de l'avant. Maintenant, ça ne dispose pas du fait que les armes à feu entrent au Canada et au Québec par quelque part. Et le quelque part par lequel les armes à feu entrent au Canada et au Québec est de juridiction fédérale. Les provinces ne peuvent pas prendre ça. Mais ça montre que le premier ministre, Justin oui. Trudeau, est-ce que ça montre pas que le premier ministre, Justin Trudeau, a réussi son coup en demandant à la gouverneure générale de lire un discours tellement vague que vous ne pouvez pas vous opposer? Comme un peu à la dernière législature, je ne me suis pas levé le matin en disant « je veux m'opposer au discours du trône ». J'aurais aimé que ça contienne quelque chose. J'aurais aimé qu'il y ait trois, quatre cannes dans le panier d'épicerie. Ça ne contient juste rien. C'est dur de ne pas aimer l'absence de contenu. On peut dire « faites un effort ». D'où mon impression que ce gouvernement-là après six ans et trois élections, à la première journée de son mandat, n'a déjà plus rien à dire. Comme dans bon vieux temps, il faudra qu'on fasse un tri. Alors, vous votez pour contre, alors? Ah, on n'a pas été là avant. Okay, oui. officielle, euh, le discours, dans le discours du trône, il a été réaffirmé que le projet de loi sera redéposé. Mm -hmm. Mais ça ne fait pas partie des priorités législatives. Euh, Qu'est-ce que vous en pensez? En fait... Souvent, en début de mandat, on peut s'attendre à ce que tous tout, 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 tout les sujets soient des priorités, mais quand on n'a que des priorités, bien sûr, on n'a plus de priorités. Je doute que ce soit à ce point-là, en effet, très prioritaire. Je m'inquiète aussi pour, euh, pour ce que sera devenu C10 euh, sur la radiodiffusion, bien que je pense que M. Rodriguez est, est, est sérieux dans sa volonté. Euh, et je réitère le même point. La, langue, la loi sur les langues officielles du Canada devrait s'attarder à protéger le français à l'extérieur du Québec, puisque le français à l'intérieur du Québec pourrait et devrait n'être protégé que par l'intervention de l'Assemblée nationale, qui a à la fois a une meilleure volonté, une meilleure vision et une meilleure légitimité en de telles matières. Sur les armes de poing, est-ce que vous avez été rassuré par les réactions jusqu'à maintenant là, des euh, ministres? Je suis rassuré par le fait que le gouvernement du Québec a l'intention de prendre à bras le corps un enjeu que le premier ministre du Canada ne semble pas euh, vouloir prendre. Mais il reste, quoi qu'on en dise, que les frontières qui sont un peu poreuses en matière de circulation d'armes à feu, d'armes de poing, resteront de toute façon de juridiction fédérale et sous le contrôle de la GRC. On justement leur, lui donne le pouvoir d'interdire les armes de poing. Mm. Donc, comment, euh, comment expliquer la réaction de Québec actuellement qui demande au fédéral de faire sa job à sa place? En fait, la réaction de Québec porte davantage dans la compréhension que j'en ai sur le contrôle des frontières parce que interdire les armes de poing sur le territoire par l'action des polices municipales et de la Sûreté du Québec, c'est une chose. Mais si les frontières sont un gruyère, c'est-à-dire si on a un chemin Roxham des armes de poing, on n'est pas sorti du bois. To bring back the hybrid parliament. She said, yes, I'm the liberals. Yeah. All right.
Good afternoon. To the Canadians watching at home, I have one message for you. Conservatives will be your voice. We will be the voice for the millions of Canadians being left behind in Justin Trudeau's economy. Today, we heard more of the same from the Trudeau government. What we didn't hear was a plan for the economy, a plan to tackle the cost of living crisis. Wages are flat and more jobs are part-time and precarious. Young families are being priced out of the neighborhoods they grew up in. Les étudiants des collèges ou des universités renoncent de plus en plus à l'idée de s'acheter une maison. Les travailleurs ont de la difficulté à faire le plein d'essence. Seniors are trying to stretch every dollar as inflation wreaks havoc on their fixed incomes. Small businesses are being squeezed by the supply chain crisis and Mr. Trudeau's tax increases are killing their margins. As we approach the holidays, some parents are worried about putting presents under the tree. And every month, the lines at food banks across this nation grow. The reality facing Canadian families seems to be something that the Liberal government are all too happy to blissfully ignore. The Liberal government's spending is fueling the inflation crisis. The government's ideology is fueling division. And this government's platitudes are becoming barriers to real action. But Canada's Conservatives are here to be the voice for working Canadians. We are here to stand up for the country. Conservatives are proud of this country and will work hard to save it from plunging prosperity, domestic division, and international irrelevance. Les dépenses de libéraux aggravent la crise de l'inflation, tandis que leur idéologie alimente la division. Et la médiocrité de ce gouvernement est un obstacle à l'action. Mais les conservateurs du Canada sont ici pour être la voix pour les familles qui travaillent. Nous sommes ici pour défendre le pays. And we're going to be relentlessly focused on an economic recovery for Canadians after the pandemic in every sector of the economy and in every region of this country. Inflation has skyrocketed to 4.7% and is still rising, but the hourly average wage is up only 2% over the last year. Justin Trudeau and his new environment minister want to deny the energy sector the opportunity to supply the world with ethical, emission-lowering Canadian energy at a time that it is most desperately needed. They would rather ship crude oil up the St. Lawrence from Saudi Arabia or Venezuela than ensure a worker in Edmonton or a First Nation community can provide for their family. Canada's Conservatives will be the voice for Canadians who want to see a clean environment and a lower carbon future, but want to leverage Canadian energy and innovation as part of that future. The voice of Canadians who are proud of what we build and what we invent here in Canada, from the critical minerals that power electric vehicles to the steel, aluminum, and people that build them. The voice for Canadians who are proud of their country and want to see real progress on the path to reconciliation and not just symbolic gestures. Sous Justin Trudeau, le Canada est divisé. Pour régler ça, il doit agir en partenaire avec les provinces, non pas en paternaliste. Les conservateurs ont une autre approche et ce n'est pas l'approche Ottawa, c'est tout. C'est une approche d'écoute et de terrain d'entente. Le gouvernement doit également régler le dossier des langues officielles. C'est une priorité, mais les libéraux ne font rien depuis six ans. Au plan économique et culturel, les Québécois veulent s'attaquer à la pénurie de main d'œuvre, à la crise de l'inflation, mais tout en préservant leur identité et leur autonomie. Seule l'équipe conservatrice va livrer la marchandise. Because ideological policies are leaving millions of Canadians behind and are straining our national unity. We must also create solutions to combat the ever-deepening mental health and addiction crisis facing this country. Those battling depression and addiction need to know where to turn for help. We must ensure that wait times are not barriers to accessing real treatment. I want Canadians to know that we heard you in the election. You did not want the pandemic election, 
and you sent back another minority parliament to get to work. I want you to know that we will stand up for you and make sure your voice is heard in Ottawa. I'm proud to lead a passionate team of women and men who love this country and are committed to its prosperity and to its unity. Les conservateurs vont se concentrer sur la paix, l'ordre et le bon gouvernement. On va aussi éliminer les divisions dans ce pays. Quand nous allons pouvoir travailler avec les autres parties de cette Chambre pour rendre le Canada plus prospère et plus uni, nous allons le faire. We will be tenacious in our efforts to hold this government to account, to demand accountability, and to demand transparency. And we will propose real solutions to get Canada moving again. We will strive to place the interests of the country and its unity at the forefront of everything we do. Conservatives will fight for your interests and not just for liberal special interests. We will serve as a reflection of the country and its hopes, fears, and aspirations. We are here to secure Canada's future. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. First question. There is nothing in the phone speech that deals with inflation, the cost of living crisis, the national unity crisis. There's no plan to get people working. So I want Canadians to take one thing from this throne speech. To the millions of Canadians being left behind, we're going to be their voice on the economy. We've heard nothing from this government. The Liberals are seeking, a, Liberals are seeking a return to a hybrid parliament, and they're also seeking to limit the type of medical exemptions MPs can have from being vaccinated. Can we get your thoughts on that? Well, as we saw, it was good to see the chamber full yesterday. It was good to see MPs safely working together in the nation's interest. We want to see Parliament return to proper function. We also want to see the rules, the civil servants and the health authorities here on Parliament Hill respected. And it's time for the Liberal Party to stop misleading and dividing Canadians on issues related to the pandemic. On va proposer des idées pour notre avenir, particulièrement sur la, la crise du coût de la vie. Pas d'action dans le, speech, uh, le discours de Tron. C'est pourquoi on va proposer les autres mesures. In the speech, they're saying, uh, you know, on inflation, their, their response to that, I guess, was housing affordability and child care, that they would try and make life more affordable by tackling those two issues. Uh, I guess your response to that, is that not enough, or is that the wrong answer to that, to that challenge? This government has announced many of these measures before. They have failed and actually made the housing crisis worse in this country. As I said in my speech, families are getting priced out of their own neighborhoods, and millions of Canadians are being forgotten. There's no plan to tackle inflation, and the government's suggestion that we're doing better than other countries is completely untrue. Canada spent more per capita than any G7 country, and we have the worst outcomes. We have inflation that's as high as many other countries, and we have the worst economic growth. Mr. Trudeau is driving an inflation crisis, and Conservatives will stand up and try and stop it. Il y a un pénérie de main d'œuvre maintenant au Québec et à travers le pays, et aucun plan réel pour ça dans le discours. Et les Québécois, les Canadiens méritent un plan pour les emplois, pour une relance économique, et comme j'ai dit, pour les emplois dans chaque secteur de notre économie et dans chaque région. Et la pénurie de main d'œuvre au Québec est une crise. Euh, J'aimerais savoir d'abord, est-ce que vous allez voter oui ou non en faveur du discours du trône? Deuxième question euh, concernant le projet de loi sur les mesures d'aide. Est-ce que vous allez euh, l'appuyer? Oui, non, pourquoi? On va euh, opposer le discours de trône et le, la prochaine projet de loi, c'est deux. On va voir on a une approche sur les, les, les industries les plus affectées par euh, la pandémie, mais c'est le temps d'agir sur la pénurie de main d'œuvre et pas pour les autres mesures euh, 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 sans emploi. We have said for many months, and I know people in this room have heard me for many months, conservatives from the beginning of this crisis 
have always followed public health guidance and always tried to work in a safe and effective manner. We have done that and all our MPs are ready to go. We have worked with the civil service and the health authorities here on the Hill. I've been very disappointed to see Mr. Holland um, suggest that those public officials are not doing their jobs. Mr. Holland is the same person who presided over an unsafe work environment for the Liberal caucus. So I'd like to hit, see him start to ask, answer some questions with respect to Mr. Saney. Do you know how many of your MPs have medical exemptions? As I've said, we will always follow the rules and we will work with the nurses and the health authorities here on the Hill. They are not employees of the Conservative Party. We trust the Hill and we trust Canadians to do the right thing. And what is, it's time to see Mr. Trudeau and his team stop using the pandemic to divide people. We need to get as many people vaccinated as possible. If you have questions, have those questions answered. We need to continue to work together, but we need to get to work to actually tackle the inflation and other crises facing this country, and we're not going to let Mr. Trudeau off the hook for that. I Conservatives will be here to help. Thank you very much. about public health guidelines. Um, Ottawa Public Health says that if you've been exposed to someone to COVID-19, you should get tested. Have you been tested since caucus? 